Welcome to the Center for Advanced Strategic Leadership webinar today. We shall be focusing on the manufacturing sector in Uganda. And we're happy to have you. Welcome once again and good morning. Your moderator today will be Bukenya Paul Michael. And uh, before we go into anything, I want to invite uh, Mrs. Angelina Tunomjuni to open up a word of prayer. Angelina, please go ahead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that great is your faithfulness. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We welcome you to, to be with us in our deliberations as we discuss the manufacturing sector. We ask you to give your blessing and your word of wisdom to all the panelists. We ask you also to enable us to have a, a time engaging with the public on all these issues. We ask you to protect us. We ask you to uh, build a shield around us. We ask you to surround us with your presence. We ask you for, for everything that we need to make sure that this webinar takes place successfully. Thank you for this opportunity to bring transformation in this area through these webinars. In the name of Jesus Christ, we've prayed and believed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Angelina. And uh, we'll uh, jump straight into what we're here to do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the recent global events triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic have had adverse effects across a number of critical domains, which include economies of most countries. And uh, in Uganda in recent time, His Excellency Yori Kaguta Museveni is on record um, recent, in recent time uh, stating that Uganda must boost its manufacturing and industrialize as a way to move our dependency away from others. Our current account as a nation also needs serious improvement because we are consistently uh, in debit. And uh, this status therefore calls uh, for a bolster of import substitution. The manufacturing sector plays a critical and pivotal role and is driving this agenda of growth, uh, the agenda of economic emancipation and true self-determination. So today we're here to discuss that role, both from a visionary and practical perspective. And once again, I want to welcome you to this discussion uh, on the Castle Think Tank webinar, focusing on the manufacturing sector in Uganda. And uh, in this webinar this morning, we are privileged to host, and this is not in any order of preference or importance, the panelists below. We have the Deputy Executive Director of the Uganda Industrial Research Institute, Dr. Dikam Gasha, who will be representing the Institute. We have the Executive Director of the Federation of Small and Medium Sized Enterprises of Uganda, uh, Mr. John Kapungul Walukembe. We have the CEO of Chira Motors, Mr. Isaac Paul Musasizi. We have the Director for Credit, from the Uganda Development Bank Limited, Mr. Samuel Edemaitum. And also not, not worthy, we will be hosting uh, the Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry and Cooperatives of the Republic of Uganda, the Honorable Amelia Ann Chambade, who is also the elected member of parliament for Malkota North County in Mpiji, district of Uganda. She'll be joining us as a special guest today. She is listening in. Uh, she's completing a few things on uh, official duty, but she'll be with us shortly. Therefore, we want to welcome all our panelists and the special guest. And uh, I'll be moderating, moderating this discussion today. I am a board member for the Castle Think Tank. And uh, it's in that stead that I sit in this seat today. However, before we move into this discussion, allow me to welcome the chairman board of directors as a think tank, Dr. James Makara, to give some opening remarks, then we shall proceed into the discussion. Dr. Makara. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bukenya, and a very good morning to all of you. Uh, very special welcome to our past panelists. Thank you for 
availing time to uh, bring your brains and your brain power into uh, the discussion this morning. Uh, welcome to all the guests who are uh, attending and uh, thank you so much too for making time on a Saturday morning to get us all thinking about this uh, very important sector. I, um, the, the Council Think Tank began last year and we have been, uh, uh, since the pandemic began, we've been uh, working behind the scenes. It's been a very busy season, looking at opportunities that the pandemic presents. And uh, the webinar uh, is, uh, uh, it's a continuum, uh, which started with uh, a lot of brainstorming sessions um, and then reviews. And now we are presenting something that we would like to be critiqued. Uh, so we hope that you can be very open and discuss. Uh, and uh, our, our, the result of this is going to be a document that will be available to be available on our website. Uh, the earlier ones are being uploaded now on our websites, at least the first two are up. And we're also making it available to decision makers, policy makers, uh, people in the private sector. Basically, it will be for public um, availability to, the main goal is to contribute ideas uh, to how we can benefit maximally from the tragedy which has been the pandemic. One statement we've used a lot in the past few weeks is that every cloud has a silver lining. So we do not want to focus on the cloud. We are looking for the silver lining. And uh, so we trust that some of the ideas that will come out today uh, will be very useful in carrying our country forward. So thank you, uh, welcome, and uh, let's open up our minds. Have a great discussion. Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahara. And uh, to kick us off in the discussion today, we'll be having the think piece or call it a position paper from the Pasu Think Tank on the in Uganda and what we think about uh, the way forward. And to present this will be Mr. Christopher Kawesa, who is the MD, Dagan Bracken Industries. Uh, Chris is a practical and experienced entrepreneur. He's a manager, mentor, coach, and trainer with excellent leadership and interpersonal skills. He's also a professional electrical and information technology resource with extensive knowledge and experience in contract management, leadership, hygiene systems, implementation of quality, food safety, environment, health and safety management systems based on ISO standards. And he believes as his motto that I thrive in and enjoy the challenge of a busy and demanding work environment. Today, Chris is the founder and managing director of Dag and Bragan Uganda Limited, a leading company in providing hygiene, pest control, waste management and cleaning services, as well as technical maintenance solutions in Uganda, which has been in service since 2004. Dag and Bragan morphed into Dag and Bragan Industries, which is now manufacturing soaps, sanitizers, organic pesticides, and organic fertilizers. Chris also leads the team at the Initiates Uganda, a waste management company affiliated to the Initiates Nigeria, an oil and gas waste management company. He also has interests in other companies like Aurora Quality Consults, Speak and Grant, Sabunta Africa, and the Institute of Cleaning Services. Chris, is a consultant and uh, he believes that his life's mission is to develop young people into men and women who live to their full potential. This mission has led him to pioneer several community transformation projects in Naguru and Magere, areas which resource young men and women with entrepreneurship and financial literacy skills with the aim of being self-sustainable. These initiatives have turned into village savings and loan associations yeah. from which members borrow money for their businesses. Welcome together with me, Chris. Chris, go ahead and uh, deliver the thing, please. Thank you, moderator, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, our special guest, Honorable Amelia Chambade, distinguished discussants in your capacities and all other webinar participants. Good morning and you're welcome. Uh, like Paul said, my name is Chris Kawesa, and I'm here today on behalf of the Castle Think Tank to present a think piece that was compiled uh, from a brainstorming work 
workshop organized by CASO on the 20th, on the 25th of April, uh, 2020. I will start with a general overview and background of manufacture of the manufacturing sector, but also highlight uh, the current trends in Uganda in the sector. Manufacturing has been key in the transition of countries from low income to high income status. Whether you're, you're talking about England, the US, German, Japan, Russia, or the newcomers to the rich nations club like Korea, China, Taiwan, manufacturing has been key to their rise. Further, the nations uh, that control the production of manufacturing technology are the most influential globally. Uh, they go beyond just producing or manufacturing or building factories, but also manufacturing goods. They actually go ahead and manufacture the, the equipment that helps you in manufacturing uh, the goods. So they basically control uh, the whole means of production. Growth in manufacturing, especially in the manufacturing machinery and technology that goes with it, are key drivers in economic growth. So without it, it's difficult to sustain long-term economic growth as a nation. So if Africa and Uganda are to escape poverty, we must focus uh, on in this direction of manufacturing. It's also a major driver of employment. Uh, most jobs directly or indirectly depend on manufacturing. According to the data from the World Bank in 2018, the Japanese manufacturing sector contributed 21% of its GDP. In South Korea, it contributed 27, 27%, while in Uganda, only 8%. So Uganda's manufacturing sector must grow if the economy is to grow sustainably. The health of the economy is critically dependent on the health of the manufacturing sector. And for Uganda, like any other developing nation, we must grow beyond the dependency fraction on agriculture if we are to move to the first world. Uganda has experienced big growth in the services sector. However, services basically use manufactured goods retail and wholesale, which make up about 11% of the economy, are the act of buying and selling of manufactured goods. So the same applies to all the other services, uh, related services. There has to be a link to manufacturing. To ensure a common understanding of this discussion, it's necessary to define what manufacturing is. According to the International Standard Industrial Classification of All Economic Activities, ISIC, manufacturing refers to the physical or chemical transformation of materials, substances, or components into new products. The materials, substances, or components transformed are raw materials that are products of agriculture, forestry, fishing, mining, and other manufacturing activities. Substantial alteration, renovation, or reconstruction of goods is generally considered to be manufacturing, and this includes recycling. Uh, so there are these activities that uh, under manufacturing are listed in divisions 15 to 37, of the ISIC code. Uh, the Ugandan manufacturing sector has had uh, growth uh, ever since just before independence. But after independence, Uganda's industrial production peaked uh, between 1970 and 1972, and two categories emerged in the industry. One was processing, processing industries and also manufacturing enterprises. However, after the colonial leaders uh, left, the, the post-colonial leaders were not always certain of what development priorities to pursue and struggled to balance uh, between agricultural development and industrial development. And this was evidenced in the post-colonial budgets, which gave more priority to security and commercial agriculture as opposed to industrialization. The Idi Amin era and the civil war that followed resulted in regression in the manufacturing sector. By 1986, the mining sector had almost collapsed. Uh, and there are rudiments of industrial production existing in the form of power stations, factories, and mines, and the facilities needed repairs and a lot of improvements and maintenance. Uh, when the NRM government uh, took over, their initial goal was to decrease Uganda's dependence on imported manufactured goods, and their main focus was to rehabilitate the existing enterprises. This strategy resulted in an increase in output. The major industries at that time uh, were dealing in processing cotton, coffee, sugar, cash crops, and other food crops. The manufacturing sector main challenges then were capital shortages and the lack of management and technical skills. Later, the sector was faced with operational and marketing challenges, which led government to privatize nationalized uh, manufacturing firms in order to encourage private investment. Though the Uganda economy over the last 30 years has grown steadily, the growth of the manufacturing sector has been stunted. Strategies to grow the sector have focused more on value addition of domestic inputs and less on entrenching Uganda in the global value chains. 
The manufacturing sector in Uganda has the challenges of high cost of infrastructure, limited availability of technical and managerial skills, and lack of financial resources, especially in terms of long-term financing, which are key in the sector. Uganda has the added challenge of being landlocked, which increases its transport costs. So limited uh, government support has resulted in largely private sector-led spontaneous uh, processes in the, in the sector. Ugandan manufacturing is dominated by agro-processing, food and beverage, household products, construction materials, leather, textiles, and fast-moving consumer goods. The sector is by number dominated by small-scale farms, concentrated mainly around Kampala and the central region, and they are providing limited value. The larger investment is by larger farms, which are dominated by the Uganda, the large Uganda Asian conglomerates. The entrepreneurial class in Uganda is small and invests mostly in trade and services with little uh, to do with manufacturing. And the manufacturing is left to the handful of Uganda Asian, uh, Ugandan Asian and also foreign conglomerates. There has been heavy investment mainly by foreign companies in different sectors like bottling and brewing, tanneries and cement factories. Uganda's Uganda Manufacturing Association has listed 1,221 manufacturers, while the Uganda Small Scale Industries Association has over 5,000 registered micro, small, and medium enterprises. Now, industry, industry, this is a combination of uh, manufacturing, mining, construction, electricity, water, gas. Uh, industry alone in Uganda contributes an average of 21% to the GDP. And of that, manufacturing alone contributes 8.2% to the GDP with a growth rate of 4.4% in 2017, 2018, uh, based on the previous year. But manufacturing has experienced weaker growth compared to agriculture and services. And uh, most of the manufactured products are aimed at domestic consumption and exports are limited to just uh, the regions like Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, Eastern DRC, and maybe the border towns around Kenya and Tanzania. So there's a lot uh, that has to be done in, uh, in that. The impact of uh, COVID on the sector, the pandemic resulted in the disruption of supply chains due to factory shutdowns and travel restrictions in manufacturing hubs like China and others. And, but globally, there's been uh, lost revenue due to delays, raw material shortages, increased costs and reduced orders, forcing countries all over the world to look for domestic solutions like we are currently in Uganda. Due to the fact that Uganda relies a lot on importation of raw materials and finished products from other uh, industrial economies like China. During the, the pandemic, factory closures in China and other countries resulted in supply disruptions, uh, like it was the case all over the world. And you know that most of our imports from China, uh, textiles and apparels, electronics, building and construction, and other consumer goods. So the pandemic has provided the perfect opportunity. We have the perfect opportunity to reflect on and refocus on building our local manufacturing. There is no better opportunity than this. Now, as Castle, we came up with a few recommendations and it was heartening uh, two days ago to hear the Honorable Minister of Finance emphasizing uh, uh, things like import duty on agricultural products that has been increased to 60% and other products 35%, but also insisting that they're going to support, uh, government is going to support uh, local sugar manufacturers produce refined sugar and others. So. It's a step in the right direction. And we know that uh, it, it's going to support the manufacturing sector a lot. But to ensure that our country keeps on track uh, of self-sufficiency, here are some of our recommendations. One, electricity. Growth in manufacturing depends heavily on the availability of affordable electricity. In the 2021 budget speech that was read recently, the Honorable Minister stated, uh, that Uganda's electricity generation capacity now stands at 1,254 megawatts. And he further stated that electrification of industrial parks has also progressed with the commissioning of Mukono and Iganga industrial park substations. Uganda has, as we know, an oversupply of electricity. Increased generation in isolation has a price, notably a high tariff uh, because supply must be paid for regardless whether it is used or not. So surplus can be expensive. Industrialization must take advantage of this supply, surplus. So as much as, as much as the manufacturers are demanding for more electric, uh, affordable power, the producers of the power are saying, look, we have enough, uh, kindly consume it. And uh, leading to March uh, this year, 1.2% reduction was offered by the Eric's Regulatory Authority 
And this is a move in the right direction and it should continue in order to encourage industrialization further. So in summary, what we need as far as electricity is concerned, one, subsidized electricity is important. Two, increase power distribution and transmission to reduce on the power tariff. And uh, three, more efforts need to be put in harnessing geothermal and solar energy. We know as much as government does not want to divert uh, uh, people from the grid, but I think models that are uh, a combo of solar energy and other energy sources would be good to accelerate uh, the manufacturing sector. And also functional industrial zones must be well serviced and managed, managed as part of the general infrastructure that is required in the sector. Two, financing for local investors. The largest part of investment in manufacturing is by foreigners who in many cases already have access to affordable financing from their home countries. Current local financing options come at a very high cost for local entrepreneurs and it's very hard to access therefore. When more Ugandans engage in the manufacturing sector, the chances are high that their profits shall remain in country and not repatriated as it is the case for foreign investors who are not restricted from repatriation of their profits. Again, uh, in the most recent budget speech, the, the minister provided uh, shil Uganda shillings 1,045 billion over the medium term in order to improve the av availability of low interest investment financing to manufacturers and other sectors. And uh, this is a step in the right direction. And this is going to go through Uganda Development Bank. More must be done to deliberately encourage indigenous Ugandans to enter the manufacturing sector. Otherwise, this money will largely benefit the foreign companies that dominate the manufacturing sector already. One approach would be to incentivize circles and microfinance institutions to support smaller manufacturers and cottage industries. Uh, the revival of cooperatives could also be scaled up into manufacturing. Number three, building human resource capacity for the sector. There must be a concerted long-term effort to raise human resources for the manufacturing sector. Some things that could be done include uh, incorporate in the education sector, specific training for managers and technicians suitable for the future, but not just for the current requirement. And number two, equip and expose the current public sector with skills to strategize, plan, implement, and regulate the manufacturing sector. This will be, this will help and to lead to efficient and effective government and support agencies. Our fourth recommendation would be to rejuvenate the mining sector. Even with the increase in manufacturing, chances are high that Uganda will still import raw materials from the, for the sector. The new proposed mineral and mining bill should address strategies to leverage the mining sector to foster upstream and downstream linkage industries and support upgrading of technological capabilities. Uh, we could learn a lot from uh, countries like Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Uh, according to the available information, over 90% of the mining in Uganda is done by artisanal and small scale miners estimated to be over 390,000 in the whole country. In addition, we could fast track the oil and gas industry, which shall provide a variety of inputs for the uh, from the refinery into the manufacturing sector. Uh, we could publicize and promote mining sector opportunities and mineral sites, but also support indigenous mining companies with startup costs related to studies and human resource as the capital expense there is high in the sector. Support local mining partnerships with public-private partnership agreements or business linkages with international mining companies, with government involvement, and where possible, even protection. And finally, policies that support the sector are very important. In order to protect and encourage local manufacturing sector, it is important for government to enact and continue to enforce these policies that promote local manufacturing and also discourage importation. In this regard, it is noteworthy that in his speech, the Honorable Minister of Finance committed to acceleration of our import substitution and export promotion strategy of a range of goods, including medicines and other health products, products of, agro, of agro industrialization and light manufacturing and others which Uganda can produce with a comparative advantage. So in this same light, COVID-19 provides an opportunity for the Bubu policy to be robustly implemented in all government procurement. Next, uh, tax incentives in local in, for local investors in the manufacturing sector uh, is something that government should look at critically, but also impute high taxes on products uh, we can manufacture locally. And this has been evidenced in the most recent budget speech. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. And, and finally, consideration should be made on more regulation of the repatriation of profits uh, from foreign investments to encourage that money to stay locally here 
to uh, be used uh, by uh, fin uh, for financing requirements, but also for expansion of the economy. As I conclude, currently every year, 400,000 youth enter the labor market and compete for only 80,000 formal jobs. With a median age of about 15.9, uh, 15 Uganda is the world's youngest country. And uh, this uh, has caused a lot of, of, of uh, because Uganda is the young, world's youngest country, the fertility rates at about 5.91 per woman. The World, the world Bank report researched uh, and suggested that the world population will, will increase by 13 million from 2017 to 2030. Between 1992 and 2014 alone, there are more than 300,000 additional workers entering the labor market annually. And this number is going to increase. Uh, they estimate by that between 2030 and 2040, the number of entrants in the, in the labor market will exceed over a million people a year. Now, in the period since 2000, only Mali and, uh, only Mali and Gabon within Africa were able to see their workforce grow faster than Uganda's 3.8% annual average growth. So the young nature of this population means that Uganda and our economy, we need to create two or three times over as many jobs annually in the coming generations. And these jobs will need to target youth employment. So we have an opportunity as uh, the manufacturing sector to create jobs. Finally, we emphasize that growth in manufacturing industrialization provides the best opportunity for absorbing the growth labor force. Further, Uganda needs to buttress high economic emancipation by aggressively invoking both import substitution and export earnings growth to balance uh, the payment, uh, payment improvement in the country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chris Kawesa, for a think piece so well delivered. Uh, just a few things before we move into the next panelist that I need us to uh, remind ourselves of. The uh, hashtags are CASO, hash CASO webinar and Thrive Manufacturing. Those are the two hashtags that relate to this particular webinar. And uh, Chris said something interesting, but we'll get into it. Manufacturing has experienced weaker growth than others in industry, in the industry uh, aspect for Uganda. That's a very, very interesting statement. But we'll be moving into the next discussions. We are going to be doing Q&As. And the first Q&A is coming up shortly. When this Q, um, sorry, the poll questions, when the poll question comes up, uh, kindly answer to that poll, and then we can move on to the next discussion. So the first poll question is, Uganda can turn around the import substitution story and equation and become self-sustaining? Answer, yes, it's possible, or no, it's a dream. Uganda can turn around the import substitution story and equation and become self-sustaining. These two options, yes, it's possible, or no, it's a dream. I'll give us a few seconds. Um, to respond to that. And uh, of the votes that are coming in and 97% of Ugandans and people attending this webinar think it is possible for us to turn around that story. Thank you very much. And um, just to remind the panelists that you will keep checking the Q&A section of uh, this uh, webinar, there are many questions that you might be uh, able to respond to without necessarily bringing everything over into the webinar. The next discussant is uh, Mr. John Kakunguru Walukembe. John is the Executive Director of the Federation of Small and Medium Enterprises in Uganda the umbrella body for all small and medium-sized enterprises in Uganda, with a membership currently of over 25,000 entrepreneurs countrywide. He earned his master's in public administration in development economics from Harvard University John F. Kennedy School of Government 
He also received his master's in business administration in finance and economics from the University of Oxford, Said Business School. John has held senior leadership positions in the private sector in Uganda. He has as well served as the executive director of the Uganda Small Scale Industries Association as the acting country representative for the Global Green Growth Initiative and the director of business development at the Uganda National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. John writes a weekly column in the Uganda's leading daily, The New Vision on Entrepreneurship. He also regularly comments on business issues on various TV networks in Uganda. Uh, together with me, welcome Mr. John Walgembe. John, take it away and uh, speak to the discussion today. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Chris, for the excellent presentation. I'll start by uh, highlighting a few statistics regarding the contribution of the SME sector, because that will help contextualize our discussion. Now, SMEs constitute 80% of Uganda's private sector. They employ 8.5 million Ugandans, and this accounts for between 70 to 90% of non-farm employment. They account for 80% of manufactured output, 75% of GDP, and 49% of all SMEs are in the service sector, 33% are in commerce and trade, and only 10% are in manufacturing, and the least number is in agriculture. So that, that is the contribution of the SME sector in this country. So it means that Uganda is an SME dominated uh, economy. And any discussion around manufacturing needs to start from that premise. Now, based on Chris's, I, I noted a few things from Chris's presentation. Number one, our manufacturing is dominated by small farms. Second, you have a lot of foreign owned manufacturing um, establishments. Three, you, you also have a bit of repatriation. And uh, four, those small farms are facing a number of challenges which very ably enumerated. Now, based on that, I would like to propose that Uganda needs to pursue an SME-focused industrialization strategy. Now, and now, African countries have toyed with different approaches to industrialization. Starting this idea of import substitution is not new at all. In the 1960s and 70s, this was the focus, import substitution. And then in the 1980s, as you went into the 90s, as you talked about structure adjustments and so on, the focus now shifted to export promotion industrialization. Now, ideally for a country to industrialize, they need to go through three phases. One, they need to start by adding value to primary products. After that, they need now to start engaging in manufacturing intermediate goods. Now, once they build that capacity, they can move on to high-tech goods. Now, as a country, we are still grappling with the idea of how do we add value to our primary agricultural products? And I think our industrialization strategy should be A, focused on SMEs, B, it should be focused on adding value to agriculture. And the documents, um, the documents are clear, looking at the first industrialization strategy of 2008, and the recent one, they highlight the importance of these two constituencies. Now, sometimes the challenge with getting preoccupied with the uh, import substitution in this context, and I'll say, I'll, 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 I'll say why. In the, in the 60s and 70s, Asian tigers could afford to protect their markets and pursue an unfettered strategy of import substitution. In the world in which we are of a free market economy, where we sign agreements, treaties, the East Af we are part of the East African common market. We are part of COMESA. We are part of the African free trade area. We are a member of the WTO. This makes it very difficult. It means that government has, and I don't envy the minister at all because her task is very huge. On one hand, how do you promote local production? 
while fulfilling your obligations, uh, to, to, while meeting obligations under the treaties that you have signed. My suggestion is this, let us pursue in that a, a process of gradual industrialization based on what already exists. And I think Chris mentioned it. Let's look at these local farms and see how we build their capacity to improve how they produce. Evidently, when we look at the statistics, we, we are mainly exporting to the region and, and the African continent. So that means we need to focus on our neighbors. We shouldn't get preoccupied with, oh, we want to export to the US, we want to export to the EU. Those are nice markets, but they are harder to penetrate. They are harder for us to become competitive. At. And then there is the last issue we need to also consider, uh, the issue of the fourth industrial revolution. Because the, the world is also moving, because you can imagine the first industrial revolution took place from 1760 to 1840, where we said, okay, how can we introduce machines in uh, production? The second industrial revolution simply looked at improving existing manufacturing through the introduction of railroads, the telegram, and so on, basically mass production. Then you had the third industrial revolution from 1974 that focused on digitalization. And now we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution. How do we, so we have a challenge. At what point do we enter? And where are we best placed to compete? That's why I'm saying SMEs are critical in this journey. And I'm happy that the minister has been a champion of the SME sector. Just to mention, I was previously the executive director of the Uganda Small Scale Industry Association for five years and worked very closely. We also work closely with the Uganda Industry Research Institute. So I think in terms of policy, I would say government is well aligned. The challenge that we have is implementation. Implementation, the policies are good. If you look at the 2008 industrialization strategy, I think we implemented between 20 to 40%. I'm not sure of the actual percentage, but it's below 50%. So how can we do better? How can we make sure that the good policies that we have outlined, how can we ensure that the nice proposals that have been put forward in the budget are actually implemented? And I think this is where the challenge really is. We are not short of good, we know what to do, but we just need to ensure that to get our hands dirty and get going. And I'm happy that there has been movement. For instance, the establishment of UDC, which I think is a very good idea because it helps bridge the gap that Chris has mentioned. Having an industrial sector that is predominantly foreign owned, UDC can help build local capacity and act as that bridge to build backward and forward linkages. So overall, I think the strategy that we should pursue in industrialization, A, should be SME focused, B, should be focused on agro-processing, C, should seek to leverage our our comparative and competitive advantages. Thank you very much. I think my minutes are over, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Walugembe. Indeed, a couple of challenging thoughts there from, from yourself. And I'll be coming back to you because what, what's tickling my mind, and this is something we can speak to later, is how do we You've highlighted policy is not the issue, implementation is the issue, and some of your last comment I talked about problem of implementing the industrialization strategy. But we'll come back to that later on. Um, at this particular point in time, I want to recognize the Honorable Minister of uh, Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, Honorable Amelia Ann Chambade, who is the elected member of parliament from Alcohol and County. Honorable, you're very much welcome to. We, we cannot hear you, you're still muted. Maybe I can help with that. Is I it, can answer you. Right. Is it okay now? It's yes, okay you now? Are. Yes, okay. you are. Good morning. Good morning, all of you. Yes, it's nice to be here. Good morning. Thank you so yeah. much for honoring uh, and uh, gracing this webinar. Uh, we'll be giving you, you an opportunity to comment on the panelists um, uh, later on, but I just wanted to recognize yeah. uh, your entry into the room. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, the next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Dick Kamgisha. Dr. Dick Kamgisha is the Deputy Executive Director at the Uganda Industrial Research Institute. He holds a Master's of Engineering degree in Chemical Engineering and Environmental Technology, attained at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, the UK between 1990 and 94. And he holds a doctorate in, in Chemical Engineering attained at the University College London the UK, 1994 to 98. And from 1998 to 2005, he worked as a postdoctoral research associate and lecturer at the University College Lab, specializing in the development and commercialization of patented industrial technologies, which were transferred for practical applications in a wide range of manufacturing and pharmaceutical industries. Dr. Kam Gasha's work at the UCL generated two UK patents, one US patent and one worldwide PCT patent. He has several international publications and has authored the National Intellectual Property Policy for the Republic of Uganda, the East Africa Community Regional Intellectual Property Policy, and the Africa Continental Guidelines for Institutional Intellectual Property Policy formulation with support from the World Intellectual Property Organization and the Africa Intellectual Property Organization. Dr. Kamugasha retains extensive experience in strategic planning, institutional development. He was on the pioneering team that established the Uganda Petroleum Institute, Kigumba, as a special project in 2009. He has experience in project management, applied research and development, technology development, transfer and adaptation, industrial process design, innovation, intellectual property, management, and consulting. I cannot think of another person more better place than Dr. Kamgisha to come in as a panelist right now. Welcome, Dr. Dick. Please speak to the hand. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my first uh, port of call is to thank the presenter, uh, Chris Kawesa. Thank you for uh, the incisive uh, paper that you've just presented. Uh, and my comments are directly related to uh, observations and perspectives related to uh, what Chris has shared. Um, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, from a background of industrial development, the pathway uh, for industrial development in Uganda, uh, how it should be structured. Uh, we all know we are an agrarian uh, economy. We, we rely very much on agriculture. And uh, it all starts for me, as far as I'm concerned, with uh, commercial uh, agriculture. And we've been hearing His Excellency the President talking about this how we must go from subsistence to commercial, because that is the foundation for serious industrialization uh, in this country. Uh, and to that effect, uh, uh, the cooperatives will come in uh, and so on. Uh, the next step will be to then focus on, assuming we have done a good job uh, with the uh, uh, commercialization of agriculture, we can then uh, start looking into agro-processing, as the uh, last speaker has shared, for primary product value addition, uh, with initial focus on substituting imports. Because I'm a great believer that before we start worrying about exports, uh, that we look at what we can supply for ourselves, what we can do uh, industrially and commercially and through policy instruments, uh, policies like BUBU. Uh, because there we have some control uh, that we can exercise on uh, and also influencing our population on uh, using what is locally produced. Uh, so there's an issue of mindset. Uh, there's an issue of uh, realigning our industries. Uh, and uh, I've had the privilege uh, in recent days uh, to have discussions as part of, uh, uh, with colleagues as part of uh, His Excellency the President's Committee on the National Economy, 
that is looking uh, specifically at uh, strategies for building an integrated and more self-sustaining economy. And we, he, the president has guided very clearly and rightly that it starts with boosting agricultural production, uh, going into uh, in the short term, as in immediately, that's something we can do. Uh, and that may have, uh, uh, we may have to look at how we use our budget, starting this financial year that has just begun, uh, to focus more on that. Then agro-processing in the medium term, uh, and then eventually going to industrialization. Uh, now, I think to help our discussion, I, I, I wanted to share a perspective. I wish to share a perspective. Uh, and I use an example. I like using examples. If you look at a country like South Korea, uh, Samsung, which we are all using today, some of you even on this webinar, started from agriculture. So we need to understand how did that happen? Uh, it started with agriculture uh, by uh, looking at land reform, increasing their productivity, going into agro-processing, uh, eventually going into light industries, uh, and all the time, uh, the power, the utilities, uh, which uh, Chris Kawesa talked about, were growing in tandem with what uh, operations as they were happening. Uh, because uh, in the background paper, he mentions rightly that overproduction can also be costly uh, if industrial development uh, does not move uh, at the same pace. Uh, they then moved from, uh, so they moved from agro-processing, uh, which they did very well. They first did that very well before moving to the next step. Uh, and in fact, at some point, they were exporting rice to China. You try and imagine that. Uh, but it was of a quality that the Chinese appreciated, and uh, even the Americans were buying rice from Korea. So you look at that. Uh, then once you have mastered the agro-processing, uh, you can then go into the sphere of light industries, uh, where you're now looking at, uh, would we'll, we'll now be looking more outside our region, uh, products that are uh, partly global in terms of marketing, and then eventually going to the heavy industries, where you start to use our raw materials, these resources that uh, Chris talked about, the minerals, to go into the mineral beneficiation, taking the iron ore in Muko, turning it into steel, and then eventually turning that steel into technologies, machinery and equipment. Uh, and we take this very seriously at Uganda Industrial Research Institute, uh, where I have been privileged to, uh, it seems like a long time ago now, eight years ago, <laughs> uh, right, uh, coming up with a concept for establishing a machining, manufacturing and industrial skills training center where we are looking at uh, building capacity for machine building. Uh, I think when you hear His Excellency, the president talk, uh, he talks about capacity for machines that build machines. Uh, so we're talking about building capacity to make pumps, capacity to make motors. Uh, in industry, those are called, uh, and compressors. In industry, those are called prime movers. Uh, and I agree entirely that uh, if we had some of these enabling technologies, then even our existing industrial base can be revived. And even without adding any new industries, the productivity of our industrial sector can at least be doubled. Uh, why? Because when I visit uh, uh, factories, you find that many of them are not in production. And when you speak to uh, uh, the workforce, they'll tell you, well, and the management, they'll tell you, okay, the pump broke, we are waiting for a spare part, we've ordered it from China, and so on and so forth. All of that is lost time compared to the rest of the world uh, that we want to compete with. Uh, uh, while I was in uh, the UK and Europe, I remember visiting facilities and factories uh, there's one I visited in Belgium, which had been working for eight years, nonstop, day and night, uh, because they were able to sustain their technology. Uh, they had maybe three pumps on each line, uh, so that if they were servicing number one, number one, number two was on, and there was a fail safe, number three. So they were able to explain that because of this uh, uh, setup, we are able to work 
day and night, uh, year round, year after year. Uh, so I think with uh, the factories that we have, if we had some of these basic technologies uh, for industry application, then our industries could be uh, better sustained, uh, uh, run for longer and produce for us uh, more. Um, uh, then eventually we will join the, the, the 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution and going to high tech. Uh, I believe uh, as a country, we can do it. Uh, it's a matter of how we phase it, how we put resources uh, in the right area and move. Now, uh, I wanted to comment on uh, uh, the presentation by Chris Kawesa, uh, the issue of, and I agree with the last speaker, on the issue of uh, repatriation of coming up with the policies to regulate, regulate repatriation of profits from foreign investments. Uh, I think, uh, I also think that in the free market world that we are in, that is going to be very difficult to police and legislate uh, through policy. Uh, I think we'd rather focus more on policies which ensure local content, uh, both in terms of labor force um, uh, and inputs for when these people come here to invest. Uh, so if company X comes from China, to set up a factory in Uganda, they put it in Kaviramaido, there should be people from Uganda working there and not casual workers, not cleaners uh, at all levels. Uh, because let's face this, what would happen if we had all the technology in the world fall at our doorstep tomorrow? Would we make use of it? Uh, I doubt it because we would not have the skills. Not. Now those skills are built uh, through uh, these FDIs, these foreign direct investments coming in, having people yes. uh, in areas where you can have knowledge transfer, skills transfer. Uh, uh, the example I usually give is that young boy who goes to work in a saloon and becomes proficient because he's been given a chance to learn how to cut hair properly. Uh, mm -hmm. Then after some time, people come in and say, I want Isma. Okay, because Isma has become expert at doing that job that Isma yes. can start his own saloon tomorrow. So, so we yes. can now have the budding of industries starting from these FDIs that have come in initially as a startup. Then we have indigenous industries. They can start small. There's nothing wrong with SMEs. The whole world uh, economy is based on SMEs. Uh, even if you look yes. at the USA, it's the same story. Uh, yes. So I think uh, uh, that is a perspective I have uh, on all of this. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll be happy to, to come in in the open discussion uh, to yes. add more. Uh, but Yuri Thank has you. established a, a machining, manufacturing industry skills development center. I am happy to report, which has equipment for technologies that can make other technologies. It is how we harness it, mm -hmm. Ugandans, that matters. Uh, so you. with those, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamugesha. As you spoke there, I remembered, uh, I, I tell people I, I, I grew up and saw the early 80s, and I remember the first Hyundai or Hyundai car that I ever saw was very, very ugly. And the reason I bring up this image, today when you speak of Hyundai, they have the biggest shipping manufacturing um, port. And the cars that come from Hyundai um, really um, uh, claim their own on the world market. So the, the thing that I would like you to address later on is how do we move from concept to deployment to the most viable product? And the issue of timelines here will come in, but we'll come to that a bit later on. And thank you so much for the uh, discussion that you've uh, given on this webinar. Now, we were having our second poll question coming up. Remember that our hashtags are Castle Webinar and Thrive Manufacturing, um, uh, as well as the panelists. Remember to go to the Q&A area to respond to some of those issues. I see a number of issues there already that we can respond to. The poll question is, what is the biggest challenge facing the manufacturing sector hindering growth? What is the biggest challenge facing the manufacturing sector, hindering growth. One option is policy issues. The other option is taxes. The other option is culture of corruption. The other option is skills and training. The other option is affordable and available. The other option is the China factor, cheaper 
costs or cheaper outputs available from China. Please go to the poll question and give your opinion. We still have about 20 seconds to go uh, as we vote on that poll question. What is the biggest challenge facing the manufacturing sector hindering growth? And uh, policy issues, taxes, culture of corruption, skills and training, affordable and available financing, and the China factor. I can see um, uh, that the way these polls are coming in, um, it's a bit interesting from where I'm seated at to see. Um, we kind of have three of them that seem to be going at each other. The issues around corruption, the issues around skills and training, and affordable and available financing. I'm going to be ending this poll right now um, with uh, uh, where we are at right now. All right, thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, we're moving on to the next panelist. The next panelist is Mr. Isaac Paul Mosasizi. Paul Isaac Mosasizi is the Chief Executive Officer of Chira Motors Corporation. Paul has a Master's of Science degree in mechanical engineering from Makere University, Kampala, and he has undertaken executive and professional education programs at Haas School of Business, uh, University of California, Berkeley, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Institute International Society of Automotive Engineers in Detroit, Michigan. He holds a Makere University School of Engineering. He has taught at the School of Engineering at Makere University since 2003 to 2016. And during this time, Paul was key in the development of the curricula for several engineering programs at several universities in Uganda. And he was a member of the team which drafted the minimum requirements for bachelor's degrees in engineering for the Inter-University Council for East Africa. Paul was one of the four member government of Uganda technical team appointed by the Ministry of Internal Affairs to provide technical advisory and assistance during the implementation of the National Security Information System Project Phase 1, 2009 to 2011, which subsequently evolved into the National Identification and Registration Authority. Paul was a member of the nine-member visitation committee of Makere University 2016, appointed by His Excellency Yori Kaguta Museveni to advise government on the most viable intervention toward re realizing a vibrant higher education system in Uganda. Welcome, Mr. Paul Isaac Musasizi, and it is uh, great that you're coming in at this point in time, right after Dr. Kamogasha and my concerns about most viable products hitting the market. We all have seen uh, the Kayola and its other relatives and sisters. Mr. Musasizi, take it away. Thank you. My name is Paul, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, the management and the board of CASO, uh, the previous discussants. I thank you for the opportunity to join this, this which indeed is timely in terms of how do we take advantage of the lessons we are learning from the COVID pandemic especially the, disrupt the disruptions uh, in the global supply chain that have taken us to think about how best we can move to a level where we are more self-reliant. The paper that was presented by, the, by Mr. Kawesa was quite rich. And I wish to move my discussion by first observing an aspect in that paper, the structure of our import bill. When you look at it, which is in excess of 70 billion US dollars a year, we are seeing machinery, equipment, vehicles taking a lion's share in excess of uh, 1.2 billion. We are seeing petroleum products, we are seeing chemical products. We are seeing plastics amongst others. 
I definitely think that um, there is need for us to focus our effort on import substitution. And when we talk about import substitution, we want to understand that it's a process. You're not going to start by doing everything, but you start by increasing the national value in these aspects where we are spending a lot of value being shipped offshore, which inadvertently means that we are employing the people out there, we are paying for their utilities, therefore we are developing industries, massive industries in the area where we import from, while in the country we stay with uh, unemployment rates escalating on the backdrop of unexploited mineral and other natural resources. Just like most of my previous panelists have indicated, the SMEs definitely have a very big role because when we talk about import substitution, when you look at a vehicle, we are saying while you may continue importing the engine, we can make bolts here. Yuri has a, a, a high precision machining center where things like bolts and nuts and vehicles have thousands and thousands of these pieces. We can make those here and we enjoy, employ our people we can make seats here. We can make vehicle carpets from even materials like banana fiber. When we cut banana stem, the stem is thrown away, but it has been proven by researchers that these banana stems actually contain the longest high quality fiber from any crop that can be instrumental. And here is where you can see even using vulnerable communities employing women to do that kind of work like uh, extracting fiber from bananas. One of the areas, again, which has been highlighted as important here is the business environment and manufacturing inputs. We also need to figure out as part of the industrialization drive and manufacturing at a cornerstone of that, where are the SMEs getting the materials so if you need to make a bolt where are you getting the steel with over 500 million metric tons of iron ore deposits in the country steel is required in almost all sectors be it roads be it building construction be it um, the automotive industry and so many other areas to mention how can we identify these strategic areas and we leapfrog development so that we can have the, the upstream aspects of this iron and steel value chain developed in this country. The cost of capital is definitely another area and the government is working on uh, um, capitalizing or, or continuing to capitalize UDB and reducing the central bank uh, rate. And I'm hoping that uh, these interventions will over time help us to have more accessible and affordable capital for the SMEs to be involved in a component production as well as the production of tools. The issues around utilities, the paper has highlighted that we are generating power which we have to pay for, but we are not consuming. So definitely there is an opportunity there to see how we can leverage the power generation to improve on the tariff regime there for manufacturers and of course, we cannot overemphasize the need for the skilling of the people that need to work. When we are looking for welders, where are we getting them from? When we are looking for carpenters to do a lot of things, where are we looking for this from? The Kayola bus has a flow made out of bamboo. What capacity have we developed in that area? Because bamboo, as a material can also have applications in so many other areas. In terms of uh, moving forward with the manufacturing drive, local content participation is going to be key. Uh, feeding the nation is very, very important and everything agriculture must be supported. But as we are discussing the issue of value addition in agriculture and agro-processing, we need to ask ourselves, the equipment we use, 
where do we get it from? Can some of that be made here? How about the tools that make some of that equipment? You got maize haulers. Where are we getting these maize haulers? They require parts to be replaced. Where are these parts being made from? But also it's important in this conversation and dialogue to appreciate that the interventions are going to be multi-sectoral. We need to have a multi-sectoral approach to appreciate that when there is demand in the healthcare for ventilators, do we have capacity in the manufacturers to make ventilators? When manufacturers are making ventilators, how about components that go into the ventilator like valves? Is someone 3D printing those locally? How about the electronics? Is someone making uh, microcontrollers here? Are we able to print PCBs? Are we able to write the software? So how are we integrating ICT, healthcare, mm. transportation, where the actual demand and need is in order for us to fuel our industrialization? If we need buses, are we ensuring that we are supporting local assemblers of the buses? while we are also supporting the component manufacturers like SEATS and also our ICT to be able to put in place the systems and infrastructure that will enable a meaningful transportation labor in industry to enhance mobility and support productivity of people. Mm. And in discussing all of this, we also need to think carefully about quality management systems in terms of regulation and standards for competitiveness. Ugandans yes. have had an opportunity to be exposed to world-class products, and it becomes quite difficult if the products that are being made here are not giving them value as compared to the others. And that escalates the import bill because they will choose to bring in imported products over the locally manufactured products. So manufacturers yes. need to think greatly on how they're delivering quality products that deliver value but also in terms of regulation and standardization, our regulators mm -hmm. need to be strengthened to ensure that they execute their mandate. Yes. I could go on and on, but I think uh, for now, I will cut it at that point and uh, grant us an opportunity to continue mainstreaming this discussion to see, because I do believe personally that yes, affirmatively it's possible for us to take step by step. It is a process, so we are not going to expect uh, a, a spike where yes. things are going to happen at once, but we need to take this journey resolutely, working together at all sectors, from the demand side, the manufacturer, policy makers, and regulators playing their role to deliver a manufacturing enterprises and sector that is vibrant with instructive quality. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Masasizi. Listening to you, and being uh, one of the, um, uh, the, the people who are making the way for Uganda. It's interesting you raise a number of issues there, which I'm glad one of them is uh, the cost of capital. And uh, uh, in the budget speech, uh, the government, uh, His Excellency the President through the Minister of Finance mentioned that there is an allocation that was made towards a lot of these initiatives we are discussing here today, coming to 1,045 billion shillings. And uh, it is a privilege for us to have uh, as discussant number four, Mr. Samuel Edemaitum, who is uh, the Director Credit Uganda Development Bank. Samuel is uh, a seasoned banker, a seasoned risk professional, with over 15 years experience in the finance space, uh, operational risk, strategic planning, credit risk, project management, as well as data analytics. Before joining the Uganda Development Bank, Mr. Edem Maitum worked with the top beer commercial banks in Uganda and uh, in various capacities, ranging from risk management functions, uh, business support, and he worked turning around uh, different businesses across a portfolio of diverse clients, ranging from SMEs to large local corporates and multinationals in Uganda and Mozambique. He holds a master's of science in accounting and finance, a bachelor's degree in social sciences, along with credit skills development certification, accredited by the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Scotland. 
He holds a project management uh, certification, PRINCE2, as well as a certification in strategic planning and information technology. Uh, Mr. Edem Maitum, you are welcome to speak to the theme at hand. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to thank Chris for his nice paper. Uh, it did highlight a number of issues and a number of challenges that have arisen out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the country. Uh, I think a few things that we should have also spoken to in that space were it has demonstrated that there needs to be resilience built into a number of entities. Uh, for example, it became overwhelmingly clear about our dependence on China and uh, to the extent that when we saw air travel being suspended, we've had problems with uh, the local manufacturing entities starting up, those who had, for example, imported machinery from China and needed the technical expertise to get that running. Uh, so those factories currently are not producing uh, in cases where they, um, you know, they need different support in terms of maintenance. Uh, I think I, I remember uh, Paul and uh, Mr. Kamgisha have spoken to it, that there are components that could be produced locally, uh, but where is that capacity to maintain? So we need to, going forward, work on how we're going to be resilient as a nation in terms of how do we, do we have the appropriate technical skills and do we have the ability to do certain things in-house? For example, Yuri has a precision machining, um, has, has a precision milling and uh, uh, facility, which could be used to produce some of these components that we would need to fix the existing machinery. So how have we explored that? Uh, I think one of the key things that's also been coming, about, coming up is around the growth capital or financing. And uh, from the UDP standpoint, yes, Uganda Development Bank has been capitalized or is in the process of being capitalized to a level where we can have some meaningful, meaningful interventions into the starting up of uh, industries and manufacturing. So I also agree with the other previous speakers that given the agrarian nature of our country and our economy, we should be focusing on how do we start that import substitution journey with what we have. We basically have all the resources in terms of you know, food items uh, that can be used to produce oil and that can be used to produce, for example, the fiber that was spoken to uh, you know, for use in carpets. How do we get all this together? How do we kind of uh, take advantage of the forward and backward linkages into our import substitution industries and just look at how we are going to set those up. Now, in terms of the capital, I know there is a lot of dependence on uh, uh, banks or financial institutions, and that is where the development finance institutions come in. For example, with the UDB capitalized at the levels we have now, we are able to provide long-term capital. Uh, we are able to provide not only loans, but other non-financial interventions like equity, investing in the organization. And along with those two interventions will come a lot in the way of technical assistance, in terms of institutional building. Um, you know, we have business advisory function that looks into uh, promoting those management skills, doing stuff around the corporate governance. And then as the institution is improved and becomes fundamentally better, this can also lead us into um, you know, uh, catalyzing for these institutions to be able to access further and cheaper capital through local, uh, the local stock exchange or through the uh, private equity as we start to see the, you know, emergence of other sectors, uh, non-bank sectors, for example, pension funds, which are allowed to, you know, do private equity type in investments. They will be looking for organized and uh, successful firms in which to invest, you know, the, the, the employees' um, pensions and make a return, which is, you know, obviously much cheaper than, you know, borrowing in certain instances. And, you know, with that input that they bring on the board, there is more in terms of expanded knowledge and that 
any of these institutions can benefit from. Uh, while we not only do the work on the institutional development piece, we have uh, pro project preparation units. This is where you can take your idea in a raw form and you have a team that will help you work on it to refine it, to make it not only bankable, but to ensure that it's going to be sustainable. And uh, in that way, we can help you source UDB's own financing or make it very attractive such that you will have other players come in who will probably be more patient because UDB's equity, for example, has to have an exit at some point because we need to keep recycling that money as we grow the economy. Then uh, the other issues I think that were, you know, that needed to come up was a need for more research and development. From this discussion, I believe we've noticed everybody seems to have a solution in isolation. How do we get all of these solutions together? And then from that basis, start to work on you know, rebuilding the existing manufacturing capacity, but also have, um, how can I put it, have that same capacity available to accelerate the future, the planned industrial development that we're going to have. We acknowledge it is going to be a process. If we invested one trillion today in industries only or agro-processing or input substitution industries, it's going to take probably two, three years for those to come online. So what do we use the two, three years for? Uh, one, we could work on the education component. We did highlight that uh, a lot of the challenges that many businesses were having were in terms of management capacity. Uh, UTB, for example, finances uh, in the technology voluntary education, uh, technical and voluntary education space. So this is where we would need to start to develop the people with the kind of skills we want. Chira says they need people that can design uh, circuit boards and you know program, uh, program microchips and processors to do different things. So this is where we start on the education front to start getting that capacity. Then we would also build on the agri side, on the agricultural side, how do we boost the capacity to be absorbed by the number of industries that will be coming up. We do not want a situation where tomorrow 10 people say we're going to do pineapple processing plants uh, with a capacity of maybe 10,000 tons a week each. And the maximum production we have for the entire nation is only 10,000 tons. So we need to start to take it systematically from the agri side, moving into agro processing and eventually into manufacturing and then uh, moving further from that point. So again, the key focus areas, uh, because uh, the development finance institution like ourselves, like UDB, work in uh, agriculture, we work in agro-processing. So those are the areas we are mandated to look at. Manufacturing, we we'll also think about things in the infrastructure space, which is something that is really required. Uh, we've seen a lot of that talking, uh, you know, spoken to in terms of having uh, reliable electricity, reliable utilities. So one of the areas we would like to think about, or one of the areas we're exploring is how do we build industrial parks? Not only looking at industrial parks, but how do we look at uh, what I would call workplaces? I have seen this initiative where we have spaces where the students coming out of this technical and vocational education institution may not have the tools. Again, speaking to capital, may not have the capital, to have the tools, but there is a single resource center where they have access to these tools and then they will continue their uh, entrepreneurial education at these uh, workspaces. And then the workspaces also provide a marketplace that you know help them with this on the supply side. Can you get the components? Can you get the machinery to put your product together to a level that is marketable and then take it on from that point. The other key thing was around quality. I think a lot has already been uh, mentioned. You know, the quality of these outputs need to be uh, at par with the world standards, you know, to avoid us from importing a lot of these things. Why should I be importing basins from next door when we have you know, 10, 20 plastics industries in the country? Let us set up our own standards 
have uh, you know certification process around that and once cert certification pro program exists we are able to manage the quality and then you know once we dictate what the best quality for our market is then we are able in a way to protect our local industries and enable them to thrive and enable them to have products that are competitive to go into our regional markets yes yeah so i know there's a lot more that we could uh, go into but i think due to the constraint of time hopefully we'll pick these up uh, in the q a session but highlights uh, capital is available but let us not limit the discussion of capital to only uh, what banks can provide. Let us look at uh, the other options around private equity. Let us look at more intelligent ways of uh, mobilizing savings. And that brings us back to our partnerships, collaboration, uh, having clustering of uh, SMEs especially. Yes, they have the association, but how can they mobilize their savings into a circle? And against that massive resource, mobilize other cheaper capital, or prioritize sectors in which they can invest or merge and acquire each other to build some sort of substantive manufacturing entities uh, that they can they can go ahead with in, uh, in in the in the process of manufacturing and industrializing our country so i'll just summarize with that for now and uh, I'll take some more questions later on Uh, for that, indeed, the, the issue of capital and funding has been a big issue on uh, this discussion here today. I just want to recognize a couple of people that we have on the call. We do have a Uh, Gabriel, can you take it on, Paul, since we have a oh, Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Makara. And uh, apologies, uh, I think Paul got a technical issue, but he will be joining us in a very uh, short while. Uh, Paul was just going to recognize the people that we have in the rooms, and uh, this will have the opportunity of saying something after we hear uh, from uh, the minister who will be speaking to us. In a bit, but all is absolutely back to you. Just go ahead and recognize the people you were just about to recognize. Um, sorry, uh, dealing with the ICT challenges here. Yes, uh, Professor Vincent Anibogu is a member of advisory committee from Nigeria, uh, Mr. Newton Baloi from Johannesburg, South Africa, Mama Peggy Anibogu as well as Dr. Monica Mosenero Masanza, who is, happens to also be a member of this think tank as well. We recognize um, those as, as well as many other uh, members on this uh, call. At this point, I would like us to have our next poll question uh, before we move into our uh, invited uh, discussant. Uh, let's have the next poll question. Posted up. It says, what must the manufacturing sector in Uganda address for it to compete favorably? Uh, the fast response quality of products, cost of production, research and development, which is innovation of products, variety of goods, and inputs uh, from local content. What must the manufacturing sector in Uganda address for it to compete favorably? Is it quality of products, cost of production, R&D, innovation of products, variety of goods or inputs from local 
content. Let's have the responses to that poll coming through before we move shortly to our special guest uh, in this uh, webinar today. And uh, the results is 50% of um, the webinar respondents think that the quality of products is a big issue that must be addressed, followed by research and development and innovation on those products. Thank you very much for your responses to that. Now, moving on to our invited uh, guest, our special guest, the Honorable Amelia Ann Chambade is the elected member of parliament for Maokota North County in Mpiji district of Uganda. And on the 27th of May, 2011, she was appointed minister for trade and industry in Uganda cabinet, an office that she still occupies. Honorable Chambade would best be defined as a Ugandan philanthropist, politician, and mother. She is also the patron of Twezimbe Development Foundation. She holds a master's in business administration from American Intercontinental University in London, UK, and a bachelor's of business administration from Makerere University Business School. Um, together with me, uh, let us welcome Honorable Amelia Chambade to uh, speak to us. Honorable, you are welcome. Honorable Chambade? Yes. We can hear you, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. I'd like to thank um, uh, Castle for organizing this. I want to thank the moderator and all the presenters um, uh, who have submitted uh, at this forum. I, I, I would um, raise about four issues. They could be broader, but mainly in four, four clusters or categories. Uh, number one, I'll, I'll talk about the trajectory of manufacturing in Uganda. We know very well that manufacturing is currently the largest component of the industry sector, contributing about 41% of the industrial sector output. It, it largely comprises of um, agro-processing, for example, in coffee, tea, cotton, um, grains, cereals, spices have also come on board and many others. And also mineral processing, which includes cement, fertilizers, lead acid batteries, iron and steel. And then eventually we hope our oil and gas will, will also come on board. Approximately 94% of farms operating the manufacturing subsector are micro, small, uh, and mid, uh, are micro and small, 40 of which are concentrated around the central part of the country. GDP from manufacturing has steadily increased uh, for the last 10 years from 787.93 billion in 2008 to 1.1 1 1, um, uh, 1 1, 1, 1, billion in 2019, representing a 50% increment. Um, the manufacturing activities gross value added grew by 7.1% in 2018 compared to a growth of 4.6% in 2017-18. The growth in the activity was attributed to the good performance in the manufacture of dairy products, which was about 27.1%, and in the processing and preservation of fish, which was 24.3%, processing and preservation of meat, which is 21%, and manufacture of articles of concrete cement, and plaster, which is 20.3%. The biggest contributors to the manufacturing industry were manufacture of grain milling and starch products, 11.6%, furniture, 11%, pharmaceuticals, 8.5%, 
and processing and preservation of meat, altogether contributing 40% to total manufacturing gross value added in 2018 and 19. However, when you look at this COVID, because we cannot avoid it, what impact has it had on the manufacturers or on the economy? This outbreak has disrupted manufacturing and the global value chains, posing severe challenges um, to businesses all over the world. The impact is being transmitted in four major ways. General reduction of labor supply, rise in trade costs, reduction in demand and supply in sectors most affected by the containment measures, and a decline in FDIs from 30 to 40%. So, but let's look now at a more positive angle. What, what are the opportunities from COVID? First of all, we must admit that it has been mainly due to our people, the economy has survived, mainly due to the favorable policies that we have had. For example, Bobo. The Bobo policy has cushioned our economy. It has cushioned our economy because when you go into these supermarkets, you find that there are local products made here. And you find, um, although there's been very low level of importation, very, very low level of exportation, you can see that all the detergents, all the uh, food items, or whatever we have are all locally made. Um, another opportunity that I would like to bring out is that Uganda has been able to identify or innovate new products on the market, like protective gears. Salt is also being produced in Mukono, sanitizers, masks, and many, many others. Coffee prices have risen by 6.9% from 102 cents um, in February to 109.05 US cents in March. There's been a demand for our horticulture goods. Uh, there is local demand for our foods, fruits, and vegetable um, dom uh, domestically, but also um, in the region. Although now we have had issues with our truck drivers that there's been a slow exportation of our goods. Um, pharmaceuticals. Uh, 12, and they are producing um, sanitary supplies. They are producing some of the drugs that we need to fight COVID. ICT solutions have come up. E-commerce is key. And you find that um, most of, 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 of the e-commerce um, platforms, for example, Zoktu, Jumia, and many others, uh, have gone right down to, to the local communities, e.g. the vendors. Um, so there's been identification of, of so many innovations. So how has the Ugandan manufacturing industry responded to, to this? Well, of course, there, are going, there have been new approaches and new forms of collaboration to increase overall resilience. The Ugandan manufacturing se sector has proved its resilience producing the essential goods. I'd like to highlight some of the key ones. The industries have responded by repurposing their production lines and developed innovative solutions to support this COVID fight because COVID is still with us. It's not going tomorrow. We have to learn to live with it. And some of these are some of the examples. For example, textiles and apparels, e.g. Naitu, repurposed their production operations and invested in the manufacture of personal protective equipment, such as masks, gloves, goggles, PPE suits, and other medical sundries. Companies involved with Naitu, I visited Naitu yesterday. It has invested a, a lot of money in the new line. Uh, fine spinners, Sigma knitting, leader packaging, and Yuri, among others. Alcohol industries have started to convert the alcohol spirits 
in two sanitizers, over 107 factories are now making sanitizers. We'll be able to export to the region. We'll be able to export to, to, the, to, the, to, to the world and many other areas. So chemical-based industries increased their production for soaps, detergents, and disinfectants. And these include Mokwano, Bitco, Nile Agro Industries. Plastic industries ventured into producing plastics, face shields or masks, e.g. Nice House of Plastics, Gulu University, Luero Industries, and other industries. Pharmaceutical industries have increased their production for drugs and medicines, sanitizers and disinfectants, undertaking a research to produce the vaccine and manufacturing of testing kits, production of the clinical care materials, such as ventilators and increased oxygen supplies, Kampala Pharmaceuticals and CIPLA. The academia has also come on board for example, Makere University, which is also producing, trying to work on ventilators to produce ventilators and other equipment that we need. Um, of course, Kira is also another, Kira is not um, academia, but it evolved from, from that. Food industries maintain the production and increased value additions on agricultural commodities, including food fortification, salt production, a company called Kampala Salt Industries and Infrastructure established a factory in Namagunga, Mukono district. We used to import all the salt from India, from Kenya, from elsewhere. And the salt had become very, very expensive, but now we are producing, uh, we are producing it here. And they expect to produce 194,000 metric tons per, per annum. So in, there is also increased value addition and diversification. The sugar milling factories have increased the production of brown sugar from sugar cane. Now building capacities to produce industrial refined sugar. We used to export industrial refined sugar to the tune of 540 million US dollars. But now companies such as Mayuge, GM and Kamoli Sugar have started producing that, producing, uh, they are going to start producing refined sugar. Production of industry and pharmaceutical starch from cassava and maize. Two companies, Nile Agro and Bukona in Gulu. Conversion of ethanol into fuel for cooking. This will reduce the impact on environment as it will reduce on the demand for charcoal. Increasing the shelf life and value of some products. For example, eggs. Yesterday I visited a factory called Pristin in uh, Chireka who are converting into liquid and powder forms for longer shelf life, but also for ease of, of working as an ingredient and also reducing on their waste. And they have a number of byproducts. They produce the liquid eggs. They produce uh, uh, feed meals. I mean, feed, feed uh, yes, animal feeds from the from the from the um, uh, from the eggshells. So there is also digital transformation. Um, the COVID pandemic will accelerate the digital transformation to provide connectivity and tear down socioeconomic walls. Companies have been encouraged to start doing business online, e-commerce, especially ordering raw materials and marketing. Like I said, I commissioned um, Jumia. I commissioned, uh, um, I mean, commissioned Jumia with the uh, UNDP, uh, supporting the vendors in markets and all that. Normally, Jumia was a high-end uh, um, platform, but now it has gone down to to the locals. Of course, Zoktu is doing the same. So, exploiting the domestic and neighboring regional markets is key. I had uh, my son Walugembe saying that, how can we go for local content when we are promoting WHO, promoting the region? No, you need to have quality and quantity first here. Then you're able to export. So all these countries have also got this local content policy, all the countries. And that is meant to promote your own first so that you have quality, 
quantity, well branded, and it is a, like a platform or a, a, yes, a platform for you to be able to uh, export. So now what has, has government introduced as a stimuli to the manufacturers? Um, mainly um, to support innovations by scientists, that one is, has been key. Um, domestic market-led industrialization, import substitution is key. Capitalization of UDC and UDB, um, uh, prudent, uh, that is prudent fiscal policy. Uh, support, improving on the supportive regulatory regime, for example, for us, we have reviewed the industrial, national industrial policy. We have the national export development uh, strategy to improve on the exports, among others. Another one is strengthening the national quality infrastructure. That is UNBS. We already have a state of art laboratory and um, we, we, government has, has um, um, uh, has uh, actually supported it in this in this budget. Strengthening of um, I've already talked about UDC. I've already talked about UDB. Investment in the energy infrastructure so that we reduce the cost of of um, energy in industries from eight cents to five cents. Construction of industrial parks. We have embarked on acquisition and development of land to make available 22 industrial business parks across Uganda. So far, a total of 10 parks, including four privately owned parks, have been accomplished. The public parks, parks include Kampala IBP, Namambe, Boyogere, Luzira, Jinja, Soroti, Mbarara. The private ones, uh, Liaoshen in Kapeka, Tangshen in Bali, Boikwe and Jinja. These industrial parks are at various stages of development. But I just pray that all manufacturers or prospective manufacturers will be able to access these industrial parks. Of course, ICT, the total optical fiber fiber network, both government and privately owned, spans 2,400. 24 kilometers. The cumulative numbers of districts and MDS connected to the national backbone has correspondingly increased to 39 and 369 respectively. The number of internet users has um, increased from 13 million in 2015 to 18.8 million in 2017, translating to a penetration rate of 45.4%. Skilling, um, then 297 government services have been automated. 71% of these are being provided online. The automation of government services has led to a reduction of processing times and an improvement in service delivery of work permits and trading licenses from 30 days and 24 hours to four days and 15 minutes, respectively. Same applies to the electronic single window, which has also reduced on the days in transporting goods, except of the recent times when we have had these challenges at the border um, because of the tests that we are carrying out. Then I was talking about scaling, enrollment at business technical and vocational training, but we also have a lot of institutions, for example, agriculture, Bokalasa, Bushenyi for food manufacturing, UTC, all these have been given money to support. So I'd like to conclude. I would like to conclude by saying that we need uh, that this COVID has presented challenges at many fronts, but it has been an opportunity for the local manufacturing sector to improve on their production capacities, exploit domestic and regional markets by producing essential goods and displacing the imports. Of course, this was witnessed during the lockdown as with the 
items I mentioned above, like sanitizers, masks, and all that. But however, we need also to improve on the certain on the following areas. We need to improve on the research and development. So we must create a close linkage or a tripartite between the public, private, and the academia. This is very important because the academia comes up with innovations, but they just pile them up in their cupboards or in their, in their shelves, and we never realize them. We never commercialize them. So there is need to create very, very strong synergies between us and them. As witnessed during this time, I could see a lot of innovators emerging from the academia who are going to be commercialized by government. Two, we need to focus on formalizing SMEs by streamlining the agencies, for example, URSP, to simplify access to their facilities, but also broaden their scope in the entire country so that one doesn't have to come from Arua to come and register the businesses. Three, um, infrastructure development. I'm glad some money has been put in the budget for the rail and marine transport that will reduce on the cost of doing business. Four, consolidate synergies between our sectors. Trade to work closely with agriculture, agriculture to work closely with finance, finance to work closely. To consolidate our synergies between our sectors and our MDAs. Fight corruption and bureaucracy because that has hindered progress as far as some of the manufacturing companies are concerned. Chasing one license, chasing this, chasing um, NEMA for that, chasing. So I think we have also, as, as, as a member of, of, of the public sector, I feel that these are areas that we have to work on. For access, make sure that we access the incentives and, and budget, budgetary provisions in the budget. The budget, budget has been read out. Let us make sure that we work very, uh, work hard to ensure that everybody is able to access this budget. And the, on the issue of MDS, UNBS should issue affordable services. And uh, we've been working very, um, uh, very, we have been working very um, aggressively on that. UNBS has actually reduced the cost of their services and of testing their products. UMA to work on access to industrial parks, microfinance finance access to their funding, but also we should uh, reduce or avoid impromptu policies on the um, on the manufacturers, for example, like the DTS and others. So I'd like to thank all of you for the contributions you have made towards this topic. And I'm humbled to be a party to this. I thank you so much for listening to me. Thank I you. hope I thank wasn't you. too long. No, uh, it was appropriate. Thank you so much, Honorable Amelia Chambade. And indeed, I'm wondering how much time we still have with you because the webinar still goes on for about another hour. Um, I'm not sure whether you're available to stay for the public discussion and the questions that have come in through the Q&A. If it's a, another hour, I could stay on for another half hour. <laughs> right. I could stay in for another half hour because uh, I'm sorry, I have another engagement in the uh, post-COVID um, task force forum in prime minister's office. Okay, and I'm we'll, supposed we'll to present, really, um, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll be around for some time. We will appreciate that half hour. And I think just to, to kind of preempt and kickstart that before we even go into our last poll question, Honorable Minister, there, there has been a lot of um, growing, what I refer to as trade wars within the East African community. 
and um, it's, so it's, it's a bit um, unlikely that we can depend much on the community markets for our products. Um, and yet, with this kind of manufacturing growth we're talking about, we are not likely to consume everything. Uh, in your view, how do you reckon as a nation we can leapfrog uh, ourselves from this kind of situation into a place of success? Mm. Can I respond? Yes. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, uh, it is true. Um, sometimes um, these wars are inevitable, but we have been trying to engage um, uh, our parties, but this COVID has brought us together because we have, had, we have had conferences chaired by Rwanda. We have had about three conferences. We as ministers, the heads of state have also had conferences um, uh, through video conferencing. And um, we have been able to talk about the impact of COVID but also talk about uh, future engagements as far as uh, our, our economies are concerned. So probably uh, that could be another opportunity or benefit out of this uh, outcome. We are sharing a lot of information with some countries, for example, like Rwanda and Kenya. Burundi was uh, going through elections, so it hasn't come on board. And, and, TZ, uh, also, they are also preparing for, for elections. But I'm sure we come on board. But at the same time, we have consolidated COMESA. COMESA is our main trade destination. Um, as far as we're concerned, we're exporting goods to the tune of 1 billion point seven per, per annum, US dollars uh, per annum. So we are consolidating that. We are also consolidating the African continental free trade area. We are launching um, uh, our trade um, uh, activities uh, in July. And we are confident that while we sort out East Africa, we could deal with our, our, as the other aspects of, of, um, of regional integration. This, we'll, we'll sort out our house. It's not um, alarming, it's not scaring, yes. Thank you, Honorable. So just as, I'm, as a, I'm optimistic. Mm, that, that's that's sorry. great to hear. That's great to hear, mm. Honorable. Uh, a follow-up mm. question to that would be, just as we have the Uganda Investment Authority looking to um, facilitate investors that are interested in uh, bringing in foreign direct investment into Uganda, do we have a desk or an agency or any plans for government to help Ugandans that want to, to be part of that leapfrog that I was referring to earlier, um, to take product to the international markets. Because I think uh, it's critical that that space is opened up. So would there be any arrangements in place to support Ugandan businesses uh, that, that are interested in that kind of uh, thing? Well, apparently it's not UIA. UIA just registers new businesses. But there is Uganda Export Promotions Board that is responsible for, 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 the, for guiding exporters as far as um, uh, the foreign markets are concerned. So it has, we are using the National Export Development Strategy, which is um, utilized by all the sectors. For example, it has provisions of promoting certain commodities, and we have already started promoting them. For example, coffee. Coffee government gave out seedlings, uh, free seedlings all over the country, and definitely the export bill increased as far as coffee was concerned. Tea is also another area so that is also a provision under NED to promote, but it is um, enforced by different sectors in government. So tea seedlings were given out. UDC constructed um, uh, tea plants in some areas and we are heading to Zombo. They constructed in Kayonzo, constructed one in uh, Chigezi, two actually in Chigezi area, Chisoro. And now we are going to Zombo. So you can see we have this national export development strategy that uh, works down the value chain from production 
up, we work closely with all the sectors from production up to export. So I would like to, to co, uh, inform you that Uganda Export Promotions Board is aggressively working on that. And um, if anybody needs guidance, it's available for, for that. Hmm. Thank you so much, Honorable. Indeed, uh, uh, your discussion has been enlightening in so many ways. Now mm -hmm. we're moving into our next poll question before we come into the uh, open public discussion. There's already a couple of questions we've received through the Q&A and a yeah. number of them have been responded to. So mm -hmm. uh, the next poll question, kindly administration team, please post it. Yes, the question goes, in your view, and this goes to every person attending the webinar right now. In your view, should the funding, what funding should be, should the funding being provided by government of Uganda through the Uganda Development Bank, what should it be used for? Should it be used to fund startups? Should it be used to boost promotion of exports? Should it be used to provide for multi-purpose working capital? What should the funding that's being provided by the government of Uganda through the Uganda Development Bank be used for? Funding startups, boost promotion of exports, provide for multi-purpose working capital. We'll be waiting in the next couple of seconds to complete that poll. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I'm ending the poll right now. And 38% um, believe it should be used to fund startups. 38% believe it should be for providing multi-purpose working capital. And 24% boosting promotion of exports. Um, when you look at uh, statistics, those uh, figures are pretty close to each other meaning that the three areas are pretty important uh, to each other. Now we'd like to uh, trigger the um, uh, public discussion and I'll begin with uh, one or two questions that have been in the Q&A. Yusuf Sasanga asked a question and uh, this question I will request that I put it to uh, the uh, doctor, just a moment. Dr. Kamugasha of the Ghana Industrial Research Institute. Where is the place for the environment? The presenter did not mention, and they're referring to the CASO presenter, they did not mention some of the challenges, negative effects of manufacturing and what should be done to address them. We all know that NEMA has struggled to do their job. What is the alternative? Dr. Kamugesha, um, uh, I would like to invite you to speak to that, if you may. Uh, I'll ask you to repeat the questions again. What was Okay. Seems to be uh, the, Mr. Sesanga Yusuf asked that, what, where is the place for, I think, environmental management? The presenter from CASO did not mention some of the challenges or negative effects of manufacturing and what should be done to address them. We all know that NEMA has struggled to do their job. What is the alternative? Possibly the last part of that question is not yours, but could you just comment about um, in, uh, manufacturing and increased manufacturing vis-a-vis -vis the environment and what can be done about that? Okay, thank you. That, that is uh, much, much clearer when you put it like that. Um, I think when you talk about environment, uh, you are looking in parallel with that with sustainability. How can we produce? How can we manufacture? How can we operate industries in a sustainable way? Um, there is the aspect of cost. There is the aspect of uh, uh, labor. There is the aspect of also environment. And I think the answer uh, and what we strive to uh, a spouse as Uganda Industry Research Institute is focus on appropriate technologies. Uh, technologies that, uh, and appropriate technologies is uh, a loaded word. Uh, 
but what we must do as a country is to quickly move away from technology shopping, uh, which refers to the scenario of, uh, I have my $3 million, uh, I am traveling to China, I am going to buy machinery for food processing without thinking about uh, what waste are you generating, uh, what's the efficiency of that equipment and so on. So that we look more into technologies that are appropriate for us as a country because uh, uh, just because the technology works in China or in Europe does not mean that it is the best case for us. Uh, now, how do we go about that practically? Uh, let me give you an example. When we embarked on we have bamboo reserves as a country. What can we do to value add bamboo? Uh, we partnered with very many institutions uh, and we targeted one. Uh, we worked with the China Bamboo Research Center because we, they also do, uh, in that country, bamboo is a multi-billion dollar industry because they use it for uh, literally 101 products, including the construction industry. So uh, we sent people for skilling on bamboo processing and in their suitcases, part of their baggage was bamboo from Uganda to test on the Chinese equipment. So that we could see how could that technology be uh, adjusted, could, how could that technology be optimized for our setting. Uh, so now that is if you are transferring technology. Uh, so the whole area of technology transfer is very complex, but to make sure that we have the right equipment uh, that is sustainable, uh, that is reliable, and does not uh, compromise our environment. Uh, the yes. bigger picture moving forward, uh, because when you are in transfer, uh, you are still a beggar. And, and we've had our His Excellency, the President, talking about uh, that issue. You, you really, you don't have very many cards to play because you have maybe two or three uh, options uh, to source a, a particular uh, piece of uh, uh, maybe a processing line for this or that product. Uh, but the future lies in, we are in uh, what, we are, what is happening right now. Uh, COVID-19 has forced our hand to be more innovative, uh, as the Honorable Minister has, has just articulated very well. Uh, people are making products that they were not making three months ago. They are doing uh, masks. They're doing, where did, why weren't we doing that? We have to ask ourselves, why weren't we doing that before? Why did we wait for this trigger? Uh, and therefore, can we continue and uh, even in other areas be self-sustaining overnight? Uh, yes. Well, have we been lazy? We have to really critique ourselves uh, as people and as a nation. Where have we really been sleeping? Uh, and where can we move? Uh, now, when we move into the area of local technology development, which is the direction that our institution is trying to inculcate, uh, to go into, let's say, machine building, to go into making uh, uh, screens for coffee and rice, to go into haulers, to go into uh, machinery for spray dried coffee, uh, and things like that. Uh, then we have more degrees of freedom uh, and more options in terms of making what is best for us, uh, and by extension, what is best for our region uh, in ESC, in Comesa, where we can have markets. Uh, for these technologies. You can imagine if we are uh, well capitalized, and I think that is another issue I want to talk about uh, uh, because it is connected to all of this. Uh, the degree to which we capitalize UDB, the degree to which we capitalize UDC, we have to be a bit more uh, aggressive, to be a bit more bold in terms of the re uh, resources, uh, financial resources we put there uh, so that we can do projects that are at a sustainable scale projects that have uh, the right economy of scale. Uh, because uh, yes. if you go back to the, uh, the issue of environmental impact, there's more environmental impact in having uh, a negative environmental impact in having 15 small scale scattered leather processing units than if you have one fully integrated large scale leather processing facility. That is just an example. Uh, and I think it also applies in sugar. Uh, if you have uh, very many small scattered, the waste is very difficult to control, uh, very difficult to recycle. Uh, like something like recycling is not cost effective if I am operating on a small scale. Uh, if I operate on a very large scale, uh, then I can go into 
more profitably recycling my waste, for example, for animal feeds, uh, which were talked about uh, in the Honorable Minister's uh, presentation. Uh, so some of those things uh, are also affected by scale. So how do we do to do it better? We go to a larger scale. I think that is uh, uh, something we need to rationalize. Uh, and in all of this, of course, the skills, uh, the industrial skills to deal with waste also are needed. Uh, even as you think of uh, skills for manufacturing process, we need very specialized skills for industrial waste management. Uh, and uh, they're going to be even more important when oil and gas uh, processes start to happen. Uh, we are talking about environmental degradation from food processing, wait until we have uh, oil and gas. Uh, how do we prepare for that? Uh, COVID-19 has shown us that we shouldn't perhaps be sitting back. We should be developing these skills uh, in preparedness for uh, uh, moving forward. I think that's uh, what Thank I you, Dr. Kamogasha. But still on that, on that same issue, briefly, on, on that same environmental question asked, um, you raise a very important issue of, of having a 360 degree view for anyone moving into the space of uh, setting up something. And uh, you have, have as well rightly observed that many people focus on the end result and they don't focus on the collateral damage that comes with some of the things we do and controlling that. Um, is Uganda Industrial Research Institute open to providing advisory? And if so, um, how do people engage Uganda Industrial Research Institute to, to get a 360 degree view of what they're about to do so that we minimize on that level of impact? Uh, thank you for that, uh, sharing that one. Uh, actually, advisory, technical advisory services are an integral part of uh, the services that Uganda Industrial Research Institute provides. Uh, and uh, to the extent possible, we leverage what we are already doing uh, to offer appropriate uh, advisement. Um, for instance, if someone wants to process uh, G nuts into, uh, uh, into peanut butter, and we already have uh, a pilot process, we go beyond uh, telling you how best to do it and sharing the information on uh, how to set up the process and operate it properly. We can actually show you and even provide, uh, in many cases, industry training uh, at existing and installed facilities. Uh, and even the facility we have set up in, in Naman for, with capacity for machine building, uh, the reason we conceived it as far as eight years ago as a manufacturing and skills development center was to combine those two things so that people are skilled as they are making a product. Uh, because we see that, uh, we see that as uh, uh, being a more sustainable solution moving forward, that the people who are skilled and trained can maybe start up these enterprises that are industrial uh, and at a high level in terms of technology use. Uh, so so advisory is something we do as part of our core business. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a marketing team, uh, marketing and communications team, which uh, very liberally gives out information, participates in uh, all kinds of uh, uh, seminars, uh, uh, in promotion activities and exhibitions, and gives out information. And they're always, the door is open all the time, 24 hours, as long as we're working, uh, to access this information. Uh, the website is there. Uh, to uh, find out which technical department people can engage. Uh, but otherwise, we really have an open door policy to industrialists and SMEs uh, to come in for both training and advisory services. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamugashe. It's so refreshing to hear that um, these kinds of services are available to Ugandans that are willing to work and build their country. Honorable Chamber, they allow me to uh, push another question to you. Um, uh, especially considering that you are engaging in another discussion. Um, there is a question I have here that the U.S.-China tensions and the rising cost of labor in China could be an, uh, an opportunity to position Africa and specifically Uganda as an option for major manufacturing chains should, uh, it, for example, should they decide to look for cheaper labor and production costs? Does the government of Uganda see this as an opportunity? And uh, do we have any strategy to harness it? 
honorable. Over to you. Should I repeat the question? Yes, please. I was. Okay. Yes. So yes, sorry please. For, repeat for, for, apologies no, no, no. for bouncing on you. No, no, okay, no. It's I not repeat. that. It, it's just a pressure from the other end. You where I'm supposed to. Okay, tell me. Mm -hmm. The U.S. and China tensions. And China, yes. And the rising cost of labor in China is an opportunity that could place Uganda in a position as an option for major manufacturing chains. For example, those companies could decide to look elsewhere for labor and production costs. Does the government of Uganda see an opportunity in that? And do we have a strategy toward that? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we have not looked uh, at it, but um, Critically, uh, it will, as we are promoting the local content, it would stifle our local industries. Our focus is um, promoting the locals because once you bring all these industries here, of course, they will be employing our own. But as you know, the culture in some of those countries is that they just employ the unskilled and they don't look at, at the other professional levels. So it is not an issue that we have um, discussed yet, but in my opinion, uh, I think um, the trend we are taking at the moment is better than, um, than uh, focusing on, on, on on foreign industries here. Of course, there are, there are adva advantages in it, but um, one has to look at quality. One has to look at um, employable opportunities. And um, let us study it. I, I, it's not an issue I can conclusively uh, discuss or talk about. But at least I've taken note and um, I'll, I'll find ways and means of raising it. Mm. What, so much, what, what do the other panelists think about it? Okay, I think we'll, we'll start right at that point. Uh, Honorable Chambade mm. has thrown a challenge to the panelists. Um, mm. uh, let me take a peek. Uh, I think Mr. John, has been rather silent in this discussion. John, could you take um, a go at that question and the response from the Honorable Minister and her proposals or views? Mm -hmm. okay, so, I, I, so, mm. so yes, I Mr. Walgembe is around. Okay, mm -hmm. so I completely agree with the Minister uh, that we need to first exhaust the potential that we have locally. Um, maybe the opportunity that I see is to is for Ugandans to be able to take on the challenge. Uh, because as you rightly mentioned, the fact that the labor costs in China and other East Asian countries are rising presents certain opportunities. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at the cotton textiles and apparels industry, about a year ago, I was a consultant for uh, the National Planning Authority in developing a draft strategy. And we projected that this sector alone could create 5 million jobs in Uganda uh, over a five year period. Uh, but what is critical is that, but what, what, what is critical is that uh, the bulk of these jobs would be created by SMEs linked to a few textile mills and a few garment factories. So what we really want to have are backward and forward linkages as opposed to putting all the focus on foreign investors. So in that sense, I'll completely agree with the minister and say the focus should be on growing home, on building the capacities of local businesses to take up the opportunities that um, those geopolitical changes present. Thank you so much, Mr. Walgembe. Mr. Paul Isaac, do you have a comment on that before we move to the next question? 
Yes, I have uh, two comments. One is um, from the perspective of uh, what opportunity does the shift from the world's factory being China to Africa perhaps present to Uganda. One of the things we need to carefully think about in, in China as the world's factory is the skill. When you go to China and you're looking for a specific skill, be it uh, in um, automation, be it in um, fabrication, be it in processing, the skill is there. So I think uh, as we think about what we can offer the world, because definitely collaboration and cooperation and co-location of industries, especially in the market is going to be important as Africa grows. One of the areas we are going to have to focus on is developing our human resource with the necessary skills to participate in manufacturing. We cannot downplay the value of having some of the multinational companies working with us to transfer technology with a focus ultimately on the African market. Um, as we are discussing what has happened during the period of COVID, the potential for us to export sanitizers, the potential for us to export um, PPE and others, I think there is an opportunity there uh to 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 work with some of these multinationals which have been uh, positioned in uh in china and other asian countries to see how we can leverage on uh joint ventures very well and we've seen work in so many other economies to fuel and leapfrog not only fbi but also help me trying to read. I think that is going to be critical, especially as we move towards uh, high-tech industrialization. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Masasizi. And before, um, a lot of this discussion is triggering a couple of things um, of, uh, in my mind, and this could go to anywhere, including Honorable Minister. Uh, when you look at the COVID-19 situation, you will notice that a lot of the discussion we are having is in a sense largely um, reactive for lack of a better expression. How, how then do we practically move this manufacturing growth to a more proactive stance? And, and this question is coming right from the discussion we just had because um, I, I, my view is that focusing only locally until we have matured to a certain stage is taking a very precautious approach. And yet, if we're talking about taking that um, quantum leap um, uh, in that space, we cannot avoid looking either at external markets or at partnerships with um, uh, the, these kinds of, um, of people. And that has been very, very apparent, for example, in the fourth industrial revolution space where you now find uh, people working out of Africa and uh, developing softwares for Silicon Valley. But I know the discussion today is limited to manufacturing. Um, what can practically be done to get Uganda into a proactive stance, into that place that uh, Mr. Musa Sisi has referred to as when you go to China, skill is there. But we all know that that wasn't the case always. I referred to earlier um, to the Hyundai car that I saw in 1982, it was an ugly piece of metal. Today, when you look at the, the, the Hyundai vehicles that are out there, they compete with the Mercedes-Benz cars of this world. Um, but there was something that the South Korean people did uh, in a number of things to, uh, to just get out of that zone quickly without necessarily focusing on just South Korea. So that's my paradox, and I throw it out to any one or two people, then we, we can ask another question. Honorable, your microphone is muted. Are you speaking to us? Yes. Well, thank you. Oh, um, I want to I want to thank thank you. I want to thank Musasizi, and I want to support his idea. But that could come in form of strategic partnerships or consortiums. We could form consortiums with them instead of allowing them to um, to to uh, bring their industries directly here, we could form partnerships, we could form um, 
joint ventures, like he said, because we need the te technology, we need the technological skills, the expertise, we need the skilling, we need, um, uh, we need uh, um, technology mainly because we must admit that we, we, we are still, I, want, I don't want to call ourselves backward, but we still have uh, a lot to, to do to be able to fully, um, uh, to fully uh, engage um, in technology. So it could come in form of consortiums, joint venture, um, uh, partnerships, um, it would, it would work that way, because as we said, we need, we need, um, technology and, and skills. And, mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable. Do we have anyone take her before we go to, uh, Dr. Kamugasha, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, just to add to that, how, uh, I, was, I was tickled by the reference to South Korea because it's a model that I admire uh, in terms of uh, how they've gone about the industry development. Uh, not so long ago, we were grappling with an industrial, developing an industrial master plan. Uh, and that was before COVID. Uh, but I think what is necessary to, to get to the promised land where we we are fully engaged in, in 4IR, Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, we, we have to have a master plan and go about it in a phased way uh, because it's not a simple task. It's, it's actually, industrialization is not easy, uh, even when you know what you should do because it, yeah, it's resource intensive, uh, both, both financially and in terms of uh, the army of personnel that you need, uh, like Paul rightly, Holmes, as he rightly notices, that when you go to China, uh, those skills that you find have taken a lot of time to cultivate. Uh, when you go to training schools in China, uh, there's heavy investment in the equipment where even technicians are trained. Even the artisans, what we call an artisan in China, the level of training and infrastructure that is available for training them uh, is staggering. It is really huge. Uh, so since we cannot, with our resources, uh, afford to really go uh, uh, very fast, uh, but we know what to do. We, we put it in phases and we say, okay, if our focus is agro-processing industries in the short term, uh, what is required? And we cost it, uh, if we are looking at uh, processing foods, what must we do to produce uh, enough maize to have an industry around maize uh, and, and uh, you know, to make it sustainable. So, so I think uh, we need to look at how do we go from agriculture to agro-processing uh, and what is needed and cost it and really have it strategically developed uh, and the timeline for, for doing that. How do we then transition from uh, agro-industries to light industries? Uh, that start using some of our minerals, that start uh, uh, using other forms of energy beyond the hydroelectric. Um, uh, what are we doing with solar and so on? What, generally the utilities and inputs are that go in. How do we start substituting uh, some of the inputs that are majorly imported uh, and, and have a sustainable light industry within our industrial parks and even privately? Uh, and beyond that, uh, in the medium to longer term, how do we transition from light industries to heavy industries that are using maybe our iron ore, which we beneficiate, going to steel, going to products, going to technology, going to those things, and eventually make an ag that ugly car that you're talking about, and then uh, over time, improve, improve. The improvement, what Hyundai did, uh, what you're speaking about there is innovation. How are we managing? How are we going to manage our innovation ecosystem, uh, and, and, as, as rightly asked uh, by, by Honorable Minister, how are we going to take um, innovations from academia and R&D and take them to, for as long as they're staying on the shelf, there's something wrong there. The private sector should be sucking up these things uh, that the smart sure. people at universities are developing. Uh, sure. uh, and let me tell you this very quickly. When I was developing our national intellectual property policy, 
I found that the missing pillar, the pillar which was not working in the quadruple helix of innovation was private sector. Because you see government and uh, research uh, and academia, which is universities uh, and research institutions, those are pushers of innovation. Uh, these are people who are coming up with prototypes. These are people who are, what you need is a hungry appetite from industry to suck them up. Uh, when I was at UCL in the UK, they would be uh, an industry representative coming to our labs every, every week to see what we are doing and what they can take from us under license. They would say, patent this, we are happy, we'll take the rights, you people can continue with your research, we'll take this and we'll commercialize it, and they would. Uh, so, so that pillar is missing, uh, and therefore, that is why institutions like ours, URI, we, are, we, we pay a lot of focus on incubation because until we have an industry that is innovation centric and is hungry for what has been innovated at Makerere, what has been developed at Jambo, that we, we, whether it's an ICT product or it is a food product by Cham Hanjiri, that they can take from this gentleman and turn it into commercial banana juice and leave Cham Hanjiri in his lab laboratory. We, we are still going to be, so we need to deal with innovation, we need, uh, even as we deal with technology and manufacturing. Uh, so I think these are, uh, uh, it's an extremely important conversation, how we link all of these value chains, what is happening in financing, what is happening in skilling, what is happening uh, uh, in manufacturing and, and the other sectors of the economy. How do you link them uh, so that uh, we can eventually one day say, we also a high tech producer. It will take a long time, but if we design these steps, uh, and set the strategic direction and do it in a piecemeal way to say, what are we going to chew on for now? And what, what are the targets? We set concrete targets. Uh, and then when do we shift from one phase to the other? Uh, I think uh, we need to be organized uh, in that way uh, as a people and financially to be able to do it. Uh, because it's a business, it's an enterprise. Thank so you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kamugasha. Honorable Chambade, am I right in uh, saying that it seems you're ready to move on for your next appointment? Kindly unmute your microphone and give us some final words if that's the case. Okay. So um, I just wanted to respond to Dr. Kamgasha's issue about South, South Korea. We already have an engagement with South Korea. We constructed um, constructed storage fruit factory with South Korea and uh, in partnership with uh, UDC. So they brought in machinery, they trained our people. So now we have the skills, we have the machinery and we are producing juice in, in, um, in, uh, in Soroti. So now our role now as government is to expand that factory because it's already producing concentrates, the concentrates and also exporting to Kenya. So I'd like to conclude by stating, you wanted to know about the exports. We have the trade portal uh, showing what we, we deal in, the commodities we deal in, and it is Uganda, trade, um, governmentoguganda.ug. And another area where exporters could promote, uh, I mean, manufacturers could promote their exports is joining stock exchange because once you're in stock exchange then other um uh, other stakeholders in in business in other countries would know what products you have would know more about you would know that you are credible but uganda manufacturers do not want to join the stock exchange now the stocks are so low this is the best time to join because they are affordable you can buy as many shares as possible and you go um, uh, and you join the stock exchange. So I would like to conclude by stating that uh, I, um, these have been uh, va valuable uh, comments or presentations. They will definitely help us as a Minister of Industry to improve on our services. And this is, um, and some of the areas we need to, um, to think through them for example, like this issue of US-China tension. It's an issue we hadn't thought about before. And I want to thank Castle. I want to thank the moderator. I want to thank um, 
seen uh, people who have been um, in the trade fraternity, like John, John Walugemba has been in trade fraternity forever. Uh, I'm glad to see that you have now formed a federation. That has been your aspiration. And please, let's work closely together because your areas are of interest to us. I want to thank John Musasizi, Paul, Paul Musasizi. I've seen Paul as a young man when I was a PPS, and I'm very proud of him to see that Kira Motors is now in place. And I'm very proud to note that there is a ministry called Science and Technology that is helping to push science and technology forward. So um, all, all these are key players. I would like to thank you, sir, for Mr. Bukenya also. Yes, please. And all, and all, yes, and all other members uh, of the panel. I hope we'll, we will get um, copies of uh, soft, soft copies of, of, of all this so yes, that it, it builds or improves on our services. I th I'm sorry I've had to leave earlier. I'm just under a bit of pressure, but I thank you so much for hosting me as a special guest. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable, and thank you for honoring our invitation. We have been privileged to host you here today, and thank you for taking up the discussions that we've held here. We shall deliver a copy of these discussions to you, uh, indeed, and mm. we'll be looking forward to being of support to you in the future. Thank you, Uncle. And next time, do, do not hesitate. I'll be there. Castle, I've been following you. You're being, uh, we've been doing a good job in business. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, I'll, uh, Please do not hesitate to involve me whenever you have any other opportunity. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable. Please feel yeah. free to leave as and when you're ready to leave. Thank and, you. You can uh, continue. Hmm. We continue in the discussion. I want to focus on two of our panelists who have been relatively quiet, and that is Mr. John Walugembe and uh, Mr. Samuel Edem Maitum. Mr. Walugembe, there is a question that is uh, uh, sent by um, Christine Alupo. Uh, Mr. Walugembe, it's clear to me, Mr. Walugembe, it's clear to me that uh, administration, please help us with the, with the honorable login. Um, Mr. Walugembe, it's clear to me that Ugandans, even those that can marshal resources, do not know the, about the opportunities in manufacturing. And so they concentrate in things they know, like the real estate. The sector has been typecast as beyond reach to a good extent. What can be done to address this and who can do it? Mr. Walgembe, could you please respond to that? Okay, um, thank you, Paul. First of all, allow me to be rather controversial by disagreeing <clears throat> with some of the earlier submissions. I would not use South Korea as an example for Uganda's industrialization journey. Those who know the context know that the context is fundamentally different. The environment in which the Asian tigers grew cannot be leveraged by a country like Uganda now. They all prospered under dictators. They all prospered under strict protectionism, which we can no longer, we, we don't have a liberty as a signatory to various trade protocols to leverage. So besides, we have a very small market. So you cannot set up a Hyundai in Uganda. It's, you just don't set up a white elephant. And that's why sometimes, the catch-up industrialization, as I would call it, catch-up industrialization, or trying to catch up, but conditions have fundamentally changed. In our country, the cost of electricity is high. We have a small market. ASCII levels are still low. So how do you, 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 so you cannot really fashion yourself into a new China or the new North Korea. You have to find your unique space. And when I was looking at the statistics, most SMEs now, in services and commerce and trade. It means people are leaving agriculture and instead of proceeding to manufacturing, they are going into the service, um, the service sector. And um, so that's moreover the low service sector, which is, very, which is very sad because it means that 
uh, they are living from hand to mouth. And that's what we call, we tend to call the informal, the, 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 the informal sector. So let's create Uganda's industrialization in our own characteristics, starting from what we have. Uh, what Korea did is good. What China is doing is miraculous. What Indonesia has done is amazing. The same with Malaysia. But maybe we may not necessarily be able to, uh, to follow that same path and succeed. Let's try to follow our own uh, unique uh, characteristics. That would be my comment. Now, on the issue, and the other issue is about outsourcing development. We cannot, no country has developed on the back of foreigners. Yes, we can collaborate like the Chinese did uh, starting from, the, from 1979 um, with Deng's approach of opening up and so on. But you see they have maintained, they have taken on capitalism with uh, socialist principles. So they've been able to create their own success that is unique, uh, that, that's, that, that's, that's unique to them. So my view is how can we develop starting from what we have we are an SME economy, we cannot change that. We may want to have very many large industries, but the market is too small. And if you are pursuing a buy Uganda, build Uganda policy, we are pursuing a trade protection, import substitution policy, then it means that we are going to attract retaliation from our neighbors. If you attract retaliation, it means that we no longer have markets to export to. And then we end up with white elephants. So we have to be very careful what kind of approach um, we take in the context we are in. Coming to your question, Ugandans don't know where to invest. And I think this is, this is, a, this is a big problem. Um, most Ugandans want easy money. They want what they call passive income. They want to work in UDB and make 20 million in their business at the same time, which does not make sense. They want to work in Stanbic Bank, receive a salary, and at the same time be able to earn uh, a lot of money without putting in much effort. So this, this low appetite for risk, they, they, they want the safety of employment, and but to enjoy the benefits of entrepreneurship, which is very, it's a very unique scenario. So my view is um, Ugandans need, need to be handheld and supported to see opportunities and to know that manufacturing is a profitable venture. It's, uh, but it also requires a lot of effort because with manufacturing, you have to put in time. You have to hire the right people. You have to ensure that you pay them well. You have to ensure that the product comes out right. Not just on Monday, but on Tuesday, on Friday, next week, the other week. So it's very tasking. And that's why some Ugandans are not willing to take on that, uh, to take on that burden. And let's also be fair, the cost of capital here is focused very much on the short term. We have short term capital, mainly trade finance. Most banks are simply focused on lending you money. You go to China, you buy, you come back, you repay. So UDB's role ideally should be to bridge that gap, to provide patient and long-term capital so that people can be able, can be able to take on such, such enterprises. So there's the issue of capital, there's the issue of skill and know-how. How do you, how do you actually manufacture bread? How does the equipment work? Where do you sell? How do you get a UNBA certificate and so on? And that's where institutions like URI, I, I, I know URI is doing a good job at incubating, at training. They, they, they are invaluable in this, in this, in this task, in unholding people to be able to start uh, manufacturing entities. The other is to belong to associations. You can't be a loner in a, as, 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 a, as, a, as a manufacturer. You have to associate through the manufacturers association, small scale industries association, the federation and others. So these are my thoughts for now, Paul. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, uh, John, on your comments. In your comments, you, you, you commented about something you referred to as white elephants. Yes. And you also said that it is not, uh, you've not seen a country that has developed based on uh, foreigners, for lack of a better expression. Correct. In, uh, in his um, book, From Third World to First, the yes. late Lee Kuan Yew, yes. who is the visionary leader of Singapore, highlights the growth of Singapore, yes. which kind of seems to 
speak contrary to what you have said. What are your comments about that? Because we know that Singapore never had any natural resources. Yes. They only had people and their growth was on the back of foreigners. However, there was a very, very careful and deliberate strain of uh, skills transfer that was followed okay. in the growth of Singapore. Okay. Uh, don't you think that same model can apply for us? The second thing about Singapore, they never focused on their local markets to grow. They leapfrogged even their own regional because Malaysia at the time never really wanted Singapore to grow. So they looked on markets beyond Singapore to take the skills and the products and services that they were developing. Don't you think that um, as SMEs, we need to put our sights beyond just the local market in, in, in sight of the, the, the references I just cited? Okay, that's what I said earlier, that the, the challenge with us, the elite, is that we, we read books and we are unable to contextualize. The, the, the environment in which Lee Kuan Yew ruled Singapore with an iron fist for 30 years cannot happen now. It was in that same context that South Korea developed, Malaysia developed, Indonesia developed, Singapore developed. So we are not saying that a country can develop on its own through isolation. This is not what we are saying. We are simply saying that partnerships should be strategic in nature and should seek to build local capacity. Now, Uganda and Singapore cannot be compared. Singapore had a very, I mean, although it was poor at independence, it had a very robust human resource. And this is where they leveraged. And if you read that book, you'll see that Lee Kuan Yew made an effort to ensure that he trains the best people to come and run things. He takes them to the best universities. He brings them back and pays them well. This is very important. It's the human resource that's the backbone of everything. So for, for, for Singapore, the trick is the human resource. It's not the, the partnerships they had with multinationals. It's not the big companies they set up like Singapore Airlines. It's the human resource that made these things work. So I think as a country, the key lesson from the Singapore story should be, how can we ensure that we have the best people running things? If you want Uganda Airlines to succeed, let advertise the position and let the best Ugandan run Ugandan Airlines. If you want to collect the most taxes, advertise the position and let the best Ugandan run the show. If they are corrupt, sack them the next day. That's the point. We must have a meritocracy where people are competent and the best people run things. So that's, 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 that's my view. It's not to say that we, cannot, we, can, we can survive in isolation. It's to say we need to build strategic partnerships that are able to build the local resource. Finally, I did a study for GIZ two years ago in the local manufacturing sector. Over 90% of our industries, every industry that's operational, they are run either by our Indian friends. They are good people, but that's the truth. They are either run by Indians or Chinese. Now, this is not a, it's, it's a good thing. And what are the Ugandans doing? They are sweeping, they're opening the door and so on. There's no technology transfer whatsoever. This is the truth. So if we really want to industrialize, we must find a better model that capacitates the locals. I'm sorry for sounding like an activist, but that's it. <laughs> Mr. Alugembe, we are happy dealing with activists. And I think uh, that the whole essence of this discussion is that all views come to the table so that as a nation, we can march forward into that place where we all want to get to. And in your discussion, you talked about funding. And at this point in time, I want to bring on board Mr. Samuel Ademaitum. Our clock is as well doing the rounds on us. So we will possibly have uh, our last 10 minutes of discussion. Uh, Mr. Maitum, we have heard uh, about the government release of the 1,045 billion shillings. And uh, can uh, this SMEs flood to UDB tomorrow? Um, uh, if, if, if so, what's the criteria to access this funding? Are there things that people need to think about in, in the context of this entire discussion, what's your commentary about that? Because you'll notice that a lot of uh, panelists today have referred to that funding, and I think it's appropriate that we speak quite clearly to it. Mr. Maitum. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. In terms of the capitalization, the one trillion that uh, UDB will be getting, this is, uh, I think if you listened carefully to the Minister of Finance speech, he said this will be given to us over the medium term. So this funding will be coming in. 
However, that uh, doesn't mean we are not, uh, we are closed for business. We still have enough resources to start this process. Remember, we've said it's a process and it's going to take a considerable amount of time. Uh, in respect of the eligibility criteria, we obviously would like uh, new entities. Um, we are open to even startups, um, existing entities that want to say, boost their capacity or diversify their product range. Uh, and you know they are in the priority sectors. Uh, UDP's priority sectors remain the agri agriculture, primary agriculture, which is good on the supply side. If we are able to gener generate enough of a product uh, such that we can handle things like the post-harvest handling and then eventual processing and value addition as the initial stage of our move to industrialize, uh, we are open to that. We will also support agro-processing and agro-industrialization type industries or entities. Uh, manufacturing, uh, where, possi where possible, we do support a lot of manufacturing entities. We are also looking in the human capital development space. So where education, again, the focus on uh, you know, technical and vocational training, we would like to support such institutions and uh, I think the previous speakers have alluded to the fact that you need uh, the equipment, the equipment that you're going to prepare people to use, you need to have that uh, in the different schools, the equipment that needs to be maintained, you need to have uh, you know, all those. And these are the kind of things that will spur innovation and give us the right human capital. We need to man these industries, uh, therefore we'll be reducing on uh, the a sort of expatriate package that many of the manufacturers have, but also the technology transfer to the locals, to the individuals. And this can also spark innovation and help us in that journey of industrialization. Uh, basically what you would need to come with uh, would want a, your feasibility study or your business plan um, and supporting documentation. And once we have these, then we can guide you through the process. Uh, I remember mentioning one of the key things is other than the financial interventions, we also have some other non-financial interventions. If you're stuck and you feel you have a brilliant idea, please bring that along as well. We have a business advisory service as, long, as well as a uh, project preparation unit that can help you go through your, you know, uh, just package your application or your proposal into something that, uh, you know, is bankable or invest uh, that, that can be invested in, uh, not only for ourselves, but for you know, other players who might be wanting to come into the market, private equity, or, um, or you know, other investors, other banks, even commercial banks. So you know, please bring those applications along and we can work with you. The key thing to remember though, is that this is a process. It, it takes some time uh, for us to, you know, to, to get, to get to where we need to be. So hand-holding is part of the package. Not only do we do this in-house, but we also have collaborations with different entities that can help uh, boost uh, not only the applications, but even review an existing business and uh, probably find, uh, you know, help you with backward forward linkages, marketing, uh, you know, money might not be your sole problem, but it could help with the marketing, it could help with the research that's needed and, uh, you know, that's, that's basically where you would be able to come in. So the other advantage that uh, you know, we, would, we have for the existing entities is that uh, we are able to also put equity into those investments. So equity will come along with other technical assistance packages in terms of institutional development. We would like to help you build your corporate governance. We would like to help you build your reporting and uh, and kind of be in the kind of shape that should you require more funding than we're capable of providing, more patient, more long-term capital uh, like equity, you would be ready for capital markets, for example, you'd be ready to list your company on the stock exchange and you know, grow beyond even Uganda's borders and, you know, and that way you can establish those, uh, proper manufacturing entities and grow our country in that way. Thanks, Paul. I think you, Sam, there's a couple of two follow-up questions to that. There's a question here from somebody called BN, 
And the question is how uh, is UDB preparing SMEs for the funding? Are they able to, to get funding from UDB? That's the question. Because in the past, companies, when they go to any financial institution, they are asked for so many requirements that may not make sense for some of these business owners. I think you've highlighted a, series, a, a list of things that UDB will be looking to have, maybe just for the sake of BN, just repeat that list. Then I can go to another question I have here for you. Okay. So, so if so an SMA comes to UDB for funding, what do they expect criteria? So when an SME comes for funding at UDB, we would require uh, the basis, what is the reason why they would like this money? So it would be premised on either a feasibility study or a business plan, depending on if they seek to expand or if they seek to start out um, producing, you know, manufacturing something. So what is that requirement? Uh, how do they, what research have they carried out to determine what market there is for that product? How are they going to um, you know, get the inputs they require? How are they going to maintain the inputs that, going to, that are going to be required? Uh, we need to look also into things like the sustainability of that business. Let this business go beyond the individual. So what are they doing in terms of succession? What are they doing in terms of training? And that's where uh, you know, we can help in terms of the business advisory piece. Uh, where we would look at your application and then make certain recommendations, provide the technical assistance where needed, um, get you the expertise you need to sort of handhold you through the process if you find that uh, you need to refine your, your proposal further. So basically, bring us that feasibility study, bring us that business plan and any supporting documentation that you have. Um, we would also be looking uh, in detail at critically things like the cash flow projections from that because at the end of the day that facility has to be repaid even if it's 10 15 years and then you know what are your growth uh, prospects and your strategic plans yeah those are the kind of things you would like to see in a kind of a comprehensive feasibility study if you're unable to do that then so you do uh, have the project preparation support to, to help the SMEs with that. So they're welcome to come and, uh, and inquire and engage with the uh, business advisory and uh, project preparation teams to kind of guide them through the process should they require any additional help. Does that include startups? That includes startups. So it is for startups and also existing businesses. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Just the last question before we come to the close of this discussion. Financial discipline, uh, that, that, that's a big topic. And we're talking about uh, revamping manufacturing and doing many things that require investment, that require money. Uh, could you comment about the role of financial discipline in this whole manufacturing growth that we have been discussing here today? So financial discipline is uh, one of those areas which in many instances would need to improve. Uh, one is basic record keeping, uh, documenting transactions and analyzing these transactions to understand their impact on the business. Uh, in many instances, you have uh, cases where business owners will need to be educated to understand what do my financial statements say? What do they say about my business? Because you might ask a customer, you know, give me financials, they'll run to an accountant who will put something together, put it in their application, and when it comes to the bank, you do the analysis and you find there's really no need for this business to be borrowing. And when you get back to the client and he takes you through you know, the, the financial statements or the statement of affairs of his business, you can now easily identify and lead uh, through that. So, it's important that businesses get into that financial discipline of record keeping, uh, understanding, uh, being able to understand and analyze their financial information to see how it impacts you know, their strategy, how, it, uh, how they can uh, follow up on their performance, the efficiency of their organization, uh, what kind of, uh, what does it tell them about how productive they are and what options does it, does it give them? For example, uh, you know, person might have machinery and they are recording high levels of depreciation. 
they have not analyzed the fact that the machine is probably getting much older, needs more maintenance, and therefore they should come for an asset finance facility. Or they might not realize that you know, it might be cheaper for them to outsource a certain aspect of their production uh, just by analyzing the, their financial statements. So that discipline, I think, needs to be inculcated and groomed into individuals and uh, the wider SME space. Then also, you know, we also need to kind of differentiate the business from the individual. And that's uh, one of the big challenges that a lot of the, the micro and small and medium enterprises have, where all the money that comes into the business is not separated in terms of business proceeds. And this is what should be re-injected into the business. It's just that I've made a whole lot of money. Let me buy a new car. Which car in turn now holds up money? And if you go for a high value European vehicle, when you try to dispose of that, you will make a loss. And then you'll find, you know, you've tied up your working capital with one thing or another. So yes. we are collaborating with a number of entities to kind of push uh, this financial literacy, but not just any kind of financial literacy, but financial literacy that's geared towards you understanding your organization and focusing on how you can make it really sustainable in terms of uh, you know, uh, remaining profitable and maximizing your productivity and efficiency. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Samuel Edemaitum. And on that note, I would like to bring this to the last section. Uh, and I would like to recognize our guests and really appreciate you, Mr. John Walugembe, Dr. Dick Kamugasha, uh, Mr. Samuel Edemaitum, as well as Mr. Isaac Paul Mosasizi. Thank you so much for lending us your time uh, to come to this discussion today. And uh, we appreciate your time. It's good to know that Castle made an attempt to have both representation from Uganda Manufacturers Association and the Uganda Small Scale Industries Association. And unfortunately, um, I think they were caught up um, on other engagements, so they were not able to join us. But nonetheless, we've had great representation today from both former members of those associations who are also practitioners. At this point in time, I want to welcome Dr. James Magara, the board chairman of CASO, to make his closing remarks, then a closing prayer, and we shall conclude. Thank you so much. I've been your moderator, Bukenya Paul Michael. Thank you. Dr. Magara, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bukenya, for guiding the discussion uh, uh, this morning. And uh, also in absentia, I would like to thank uh, the Honorable Minister of Trade, Industry and Cooperatives for making the time to be with us uh, and uh, present and also listen and answer questions. That is really commendable, thank you. Uh, panelists, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very, very enriching uh, discussion. I've learned a lot. I'm not a manufacturer. <laughs> I don't know whether Mr. Olgen will persuade me to come into the manufacturing side of things. Uh, but uh, it's been very, very informative. And Mr. Kawesa, thank you for presenting the think piece. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the participants. Uh, because it's a webinar, we, we don't have too much uh, dialogue in terms of actual speaking, but uh, the chat groups have been very active and uh, all these things are recorded. So whatever you type in there will be looked at. And uh, also want to especially appreciate those who've joined us from outside the country. Uh, we had at least six people from Nigeria, which is quite interesting. And uh, also from South Africa, I think there was also someone from Tanzania. Um, uh, one of the interesting things that COVID has done is to just knock off the boundaries. So in a meeting like this in your house, you can connect with the, with the world basically. So thank you very much. Our, and then our next uh, responsibility now will be to to go through our document, our think piece, and, and then bring on the board the ideas that have come. So these are not just talking shop. All those ideas are being captured and our, our secretary team will now pick those out, uh, especially from the panelists. And uh, then the full document will be ready uh, and then will be sent out. All of you on the panel will get a copy. The rest can get a copy on the website and uh, we will make sure that the key people in the sector uh, the ministers already requested for a copy, but look for other key people, Uganda manufacturers and others can also have a chance to look at these ideas. Uh, I must uh, re-emphasize that these ideas have gone through a refining process, they were brainstormed, 
initially and brainstorming, you just pick whatever comes into your mind. Then the, they were compiled together, reviewed, uh, the think piece was written out and now it has been critiqued and even added on to. And I must say that uh, all the contributions from the panelists have been very, very rich and they've expanded uh, the scope of the document. So it will be a document that would be useful for anyone who's thinking manufacturing uh, in Uganda. Um, and finally, we have on this journey, uh, COVID-19 pushed us into this journey and uh, we still have a lot of things to talk about. So uh, next weekend, and we'll probably be going, we'll be doing this for quite a bit of time. Next weekend, we'll be looking at medicines and biologics. Uh, what are the opportunities there? Uh, so if that's an area of interest, uh, be sure to join us. Uh, why are we importing all our drugs and medicines? Uh, what did our forefathers use? Uh, can we think about that? What are the kind of things we'll be looking at and what do we need to do, uh, both on the practitioner side and the policy side to ensure that we are sufficient in, in the medicinals? What if there's a world war tomorrow and we can't import from China and India, we're going to die. <laughs> so we'll be following that train. But thank you very much. And uh, Paul, am I supposed to close in prayer as well? Paul? Okay. So Paul, I'll go ahead and do it. Um, let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we've had and the very many thoughts that have come through. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you gave us a mind and you instruct us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your strength, and your mind as well. And this morning, a lot of thoughts have come uh, to be discussed. And we do pray that as we now take the next step and make this... Amen. Paul? Amen. Sorry, uh, Dr. Magara, I closed the discussion. So the webinar ends here today. Thank you so much, our uh, participants, for joining us today. That was a webinar on manufacturing. Next week, we will be focusing on medicines. So get ready uh, for that discussion. Uh, we will be yet looking at another area and sector. Thank you very much from CASO. We say thank you. You're welcome, and thank, thank you, you too.